Welcome to a special episode of the Hard Rock Show. I'm Andrew. I'm Dave. I'm Tim. Tonight, uh, or before we get stuck into it, make sure you're following us. All of our details are in the description for this, uh, whether you're listening or watching us on YouTube or any of the podcast platforms, then just, yeah, follow us, follow all of our details. Um, we have heaps of social media out there. So, yeah, just keep up to date with us on all those platforms. And also, please, if you'd be so kind, check out our Patreon page as well. Any support you can give us via that platform would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, before we get stuck right in things, a very special thank you to our wonderful sponsors in Squidding, Screen Printing, Alt, Cult, and Rockstar Finance. Please find them and give them a follow as well. Well, the details are in the description for this episode. Um, so, yeah, give them a follow. Give them a, a like, just a, a bit of love to them, to the help they give us here at the show. Won't waffle on for too long. The start of this, or well, this episode is all about Halloween for this year. And so we've decided to do Halloween and we're going to go through pretty much the entire discography, minus a couple of the live albums and things like that. So anything that was basically studio work, we're going to be covering as part of this. So there's a lot to get through, something like 15 or 16 albums or whatever else we've decided on doing in the end. So there's a fair bit there. We'll have a, a, a few people coming and going as we go through this, uh, but the bulk of it will be uh, Dave and myself to go through it all but before we get stuck into this massive task how's everyone going dave how have you been haven't been haven't seen you for a little while on the show actually yeah it's been all right still same lockdown stuff dealing with all that mm. no, missing friends missing family um not much we can do well nearly there though hopefully nearly there Ears open yeah how about you tim how are you going yeah can't complain yeah working yeah. chilling yeah killing <laughs> as always for you same old, same yeah. old as well yeah so yeah not much has changed uh looks like i'm getting back into full-time work so it looks like i'm one of the lucky ones with all this sort of stuff going on um which yeah. is good and bad at the same time i guess it's less time for this but it means more security for for us here especially with jody's hours being cut so um you know, it is what it is in that regard. Beggars can't be choosers. We'll take whatever we can get. And if I get a chance to do that's, that, well, then it's that's a no-brainer, it. really. Um, but around that, yeah, we're doing pretty well. Just missing the kids, mostly. But that'll hopefully be a okay, case so if we can see them soon enough. And hopefully, once this all goes smoothly, it'll be about to hopefully be a close to normal Christmas as we can possibly get, which is what i am been hanging my hat on ever since this went down. That's what I've been waiting to get done. So hopefully, we can get to there sooner rather than later. Yep. Yeah. Funny thing on that one, just a little quick side note is that all the Halloween decorations have pretty much been pulled down at the local supermarket being replaced with Christmas stuff. So it's already already happening, um, which is yeah. earlier and earlier every year. Um, but we'll have to wait and see if that's actually going to, while we film this, we don't know yet. Like this be hopefully released on Halloween. But interesting to see if there will be any trick-or-treating done at all this year. I'm not sure there will be. But, um, okay. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. But anyway, we are here to talk about Halloween for Halloween for 2020. Um, and this is a band that's been talked about for quite some time behind the scenes. We've touched on them briefly in the past, but Dave, you really wanted to do this band for quite some time now, I think. And it's sort of fitting that the first Halloween special we did was Black Sabbath, which fell on Halloween night. And yeah. now we're doing Halloween, which falls on Halloween night as well. So Dave, give us your sort of opening thoughts on this band. What is it about this band that, that gets your attention so much? Um, this is one of the very first metal bands I actually started listening to. I uh, was about 10. Cool. And a mate of mine had um, Live in the UK. Uh, and I copied it on cassette. And it's still got <laughs> old Dave writing on it. Wow. I used to listen to that over and over on my Walkman. This is one of the albums that not only is it cool songs there, you can tell that they're having fun when mm. they're performing. And the one thing that Metal was all new to me at the time, but the one thing that really stuck out about Halloween is how upbeat and optimistic a lot of their lyrics were. And you know, as cool as it is to get pissed off with some type of music, it's also fun to have some upbeat stuff as well. Mm, yep. But um, I have to admit I'm a bit guilty of um, losing interest after Chameleon mm -hmm. and didn't give the Andy Drez to We're going to have to figure out how to say his last name for this Derek, special. It is. <laughs> Derek, it's yeah. Yeah, Derek. Yeah, so I didn't hear those albums for quite some time. So I had once I did had a lot of catching up to do. But um, yeah, this, album, this band is just one that stuck for me with me for about thirty years now. So they've been a long time favorite. So stoked to get to do this special. Cool. Well, glad to have uh, made you happy with this one, Dave. It'll be interesting to see how we go through this one because I know there are some highs and lows coming up. But Tim, <laughs> what did you? What was your initial thoughts of Halloween before starting this process? 
Um, to be honest, a name on a poster. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like you know, you, you like the European festivals. Yep. So I never never really listened to them, to be honest with you. Mm. So um, it's which for me, like I mean, as far as you know, doing these kind of specials, I always find kind of interesting because I can. It's always a chance to, to go through something that you haven't heard before and from start to finish without, you know, the years in between. Mm, yep. So, uh, yeah, it's been, been an interesting, interesting week. <laughs> <laughs> Considering you got, like, the start and the end of the whole thing, it's going to be really interesting to where you land um, at the end of it all, too. Yeah, so, well, I mean, yes. And I listened to it backwards, too, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Cause I changed the order for you, didn't I? Yeah. So I, yeah. I listened to the, the, like like four of the last five albums, and then the first three, the first four. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be interesting to see how that that made things yeah resonate for you. Well, t- technically, I listened to the side projects first. Well, yeah, that's true. We did do a lot of the side project work, so <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. No, it'll be interesting. All right. Cool. Well, for me, um, Halloween was a band that I saw. You know, the old cc's cds and record store and that sort of stuff or sanity or any of those ones um kicking around at them for a while and i looked at the artwork and gone this looks really cool like one of the keepers albums and um but i had friends with me at the time we're all going through the metal section and halloween and i've gone this looks really cool and i was thinking about buying it just based on the artwork and then a mate of mine said no they're a shit band and because we're all up here and we're all like the same thing, I've gone, okay, well, I'll trust your judgment, put it down and moved on and never really got into the band after that. Because, you know, your mates are your mates and, and you're all in the same crew and doing the same thing, have the same taste. So you figured, okay, well, if a couple of us don't like it, then there's a pretty good chance that I'm not going to like it as well. So you move on. Not until many, many years later after doing the show um, did I even listen to any Halloween at all. And that was when we did the first two Keepers albums as part of a a special episode we did years and years ago at the old studio, something like 2016, maybe, maybe even before that. I don't know. Um, probably before it actually. Um, so yeah, there was, there was, yeah, <laughs> there was a, um, there was a, yeah, we did those two albums there. It was because, you know, Jimmy and Dennis were both banging on about those two albums nonstop. And I think Dave, were you a part of those ones? Yeah. Or, was, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've had some, but that's still been pretty much where my experience of this band has sort of begun and ended. I haven't really had the time to go and delve into it. So when we decided to sit down and do this one this year, I was like, okay, cool. I'm finally going to get a chance to sit down and go through their discography and see what the fuss is about. Though I have reviewed the last album they did. Um, my God, given right. Uh, that was, and I did like that one when it came out. So we did review that one at the time of release. I think that was 2016. Yeah. And they've got a new album in the works. Sorry. 2015, I think. Maybe, yeah. But I think, yeah, the one thing I noticed just going through the notes is that I think the current gap between albums is the longest gap they've ever had, and it's still only about five years. So they're a remarkably yeah. consistent band. So um, it'd be good to – that's why there's so many albums to go through. But we'll uh, see how it all goes. I think we'll, we'll get stuck into it now. Uh, we'll go throw to the, uh, the debut album from the band. Uh, so this is Halloween with Walls of Jericho. Okay, Tim. Uh, Dave's got all the props for this one, I imagine. So. <laughs> um, Dave, the prop master for for Halloween in general, is is the way it goes. Okay, so this is the debut album, uh, Walls of Jericho from Halloween. Fourteen tracks for seventy two minutes are uh, released December nineteen eighty five via Noise Records, produced by Harris Johns and the band. This is the band's only album with Kai Hansen on vocals, and this version includes the Halloween EP and the tracks and the track Judas from the EP of the same name as well. So this is the way it's released. These these days it's a bit of an amalgamation of all their early stuff and uh, i think we'll go to you first on this one tim all right um i found this a remarkably quirky list yeah okay because i don't know because there's whether or not everybody likes to admit it there's there's certain rules with heavy metal yeah <laughs> and you know there's certain times of when you do things you know this is where you double time this is where you half time and this is also like you know and when you double time you do it with a double bass drum and the bass guitar following along and then the guitars will kick in after that and then you do a lead break and then, you know here's where you do your metallica rhythm here's where you do your yeah. that and you know I, I, I know these guys is like a power metal band um but what i found so quirky about it was it's kind of a mixture. Of, these rules have not quite been established yet. Yeah. 
And you yeah. can hear them kind of half doing it, but also kind of half not doing it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and you know not 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 to not to piss off the power metal people, but uh, there's also like like there's a lot of King Diamond in this. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only like, picked up on that. Yep. Yeah, like I can I can hear like you know the two bands I could hear a lot of were King Diamond and Venom. Mm-hmm. And oh, cool. like, but even like. I could hear, like, you know, like an early suicidal tendencies kind okay. of. Um, no, but in, again, because just in the way, of, you know, the way they go into sort of faster instrumental breaks with that lead yeah. guitar and that yeah. style of riffing and that guitar tone is very sort of early suicidal tendencies. Yeah, true. Yep. Um, you know, like you, you can't bring me down kind of, you know. Mm. I hadn't thought and, of it, but now that you say it, it makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and again, so again, which is kind of, you know what? Why I found this so quirky and fun to listen to is because it's 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 before all these rules came in where we, you know we're all scared of doing things <laughs> and not being you know yeah. that's not metal enough. The, the conventions weren't established. Yeah, exactly. You know, you mm. can't, you can't, you know. So that's yeah, and then again, that's that's what I found. So, and it was very because of that. It was very refreshing. It was very mm. very nice. Very pleasant. And you know as a fan, very cool. So yeah, that, that's for my, this is probably like, not to spoil it for later, but I think this is probably my favorite of the lot. You're not alone in that. Yep. Yeah. So this for mine, yeah, this was really good. And uh, yeah, I'll go back to this one for sure. Uh, nine and a half. Wow. Cool. So, yeah. Right. This is really good. And warrior is my highlight, but I mean, the whole thing's pretty good from start to finish. So nice. Yeah. Cool. Again, you know, if you're like me and, you know, just see the name on the poster, Mm. And, you're, and you think, okay, well, you're not really a power metal fan, then this is probably a good one to check out. Mm. I would agree with that statement. Yeah, definitely. All right, Dave. I remember when I first heard the CD, I was um, familiar with a couple of songs from this compilation, yep. but only two or three. And I found it my local JB Hi Fi. I'm like, yep, early Halloween. I heard they're fresh. This will be cool to listen to. I've heard a couple of songs. And the first time I listened to it, just from start to finish, I was just in complete awe. This was an amazing listen. <laughs> it's unique, as Tim was saying. Yeah. Not your typical thrash. Yeah. Last floor and there's much going on, but it's very controlled in the playing. Mm. Um, some of the riffs are very straightforward, but the melodic soloing and the harmony lines are off the charts. A lot of it's um, harmonized and double tracked and it's really, really fast. And for the time mm. of people playing fast, but not with as much harmony. Yeah. Um, certainly not doing guitar solos, but they're very tastefully done. And the notes are really clear. I don't know if it's they like, dial back on some of the distortion for this lead guitar or if it's just a production or if it's a remaster. But I think it's, it's just also very- a case of the year. Like that time, it wasn't really all about the distortion just yet. There's yeah. still a bit, you know, bit of clean tone to it. It's in the equipment as well. Mm. Um, a lot of the, um, so there's so many different types of following on display. You've got the two, two guitarists and they do the trade-off. And you've got some shred, you've got some arpeggio stuff, you've got tapping, harmonized, melodic, structured, off the cuff. There's a very, I don't know, there's a lot of different influences, I suppose. Mm. I, I know it divides a lot of fans, but I really like Kai Henson's vocals on this. And um, well. he's got a very unique sound. It fits what they're doing. It's, there's some personality there and it's kind of like he's got power metal ideas but trapped mm. into like trash delivery. Yeah. Can't quite, can't quite get the power metal stuff, but he's, he's trying, but it's also in the fresh style. It's like sort um, of Ed guy being fronted by James Hetfield. Yeah. That's a great <laughs> way of putting it. It's a fantastic <laughs> way of putting it. Um, there's some very cool breakdown sections. Um, the song Victim of Fate it has, has that perfect slow midsection. And mm. when you listen to the album from start to finish, it's a perfect little um, lightning of the load, so to speak. Yep. Um, there's a remake of that song with um, Michael Kiske, and it's terrible. Ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> really, really bad. There's a good use of subtle humor, and it's got that knowing smirk or the knowing grin. It's yeah. not, there is some like violent stuff like Murder and Warrior, but it's all delivered in like the popcorn horror style. There's always a nudge and a wink with this band. Yeah, they've always had that there. Mm. And the, the whole thing starts off with the Happy, Happy Halloween from the third mm. Halloween movie. That's yeah. great. And in the song Gargoyle, they um, use Hall the Mountain King, which I thought yep. was a great one. I just found out recently the character on the front, his name is Fangface. They were going oh, to okay. use him as a mascot. 
but too close to Eddie from My Maiden, so they yep. scrapped that pretty quickly. Okay. Um, but this album's an absolute joy to listen to. If you start and it's not a bad song on here. Part of me wishes that they continued in the style, but then I'm glad that they didn't because what they created is a whole new genre, yeah. and that's cool. Um, if I'm taking the that two separate parts, the EP, I would give a ten, and the album I would give um, nine. So this gets nine and a half pumpkins out of ten. <laughs> um, uh, murderer, warrior, victim of fate, ride the sky, reptile, metal invaders, go, go. How many tears endure this? Damn okay. good <laughs> Just about the whole thing. <laughs> All yeah. right. Um, for me, I think it's a cool release that they've got the EP and mixed in with this now. I think that works really well. And it actually flows pretty well too, considering you know, you've got different standards and production tricks stuff going on from the EP, which is the th- really thrashy stuff. And you've still got the thrashy stuff on the album, but the way it all flows is actually pretty well done. So cr- points were due for that. Um, right from the start, the guitar work is what grabs your attention on this one. It's got that thrash influence. The vocals are grittier. Um, you've got that tongue in cheek, that you know, nudge and a wink kind of stuff going on here too. Between the tones and lyrics though it does have some intensity it's not all just you know fun and humor there is that that edge to a bit of darkness just the it goes into the grid of the overall style and the tone um for me this whole thing sort of sits somewhere between early metallica and early iron maiden so you got like the actual iron maiden the self-titled album sort of an effect on here along with you know kill them all kind of era metallica those two things in a blender is kind of where this one sits um once the ep is over and the album kicks in there is a bit of a quality difference but not huge um it's just about being warmer in the overall production which i think comes down to basically having a bit of a better budget from doing you know your ep to, to an album um some nice subtle layering in there some of the synth like the synth work this band does which you find it all the way through is very well done but on the debut album even it was still pretty cool well done and Overall, it's heaps of energy. This feels much more like a thrash album than a power metal album, uh, just with a bit of gloss applied to it. The production's really well balanced, especially for the time. It is, you know, a bit time stamped. It's got that vintage to it, but it's actually pretty cool. You can hear everything really clearly, especially on, on the deep dive focus listen too. And these songs are really well honed. You can tell they've sat on these for a while. The hooks are strong. Um, and and while it's got that bit of a darker edge to it at times, these songs will also stay with you. So if you're a fan of any other album from that era, so anything from the you know early eighties, you're going to enjoy this. If you like that era, you're going to find something in here. You're going to enjoy. I can see, you know, why this is a, a favorite amongst the fans. Cause there's a tie pretty much between this and the two of the first um, keeper albums where, you know, which one is the fan favorite kind of a thing, which we'll get to at the end of this presentation. Um, but this one, you can see why it's so highly regarded because if you're a thrash fan and this is before the real power metal stuff really kicked off for them, this is where they were on that thing with Kai Hans doing the vocals and the guitar work being the lead element of this whole thing. It just flies off the, off the out of the speakers. It's really cool. Uh, it's a hell of a, a debut. If you like it fast and melodic, this is going to get, re- get your attention. Uh, but that's it. If you're not a fan of that era or the genre, this won't change your mind. Um, but for me, this was pretty cool. A very good surprise, especially in a debut. I like the album flow, the pacing, the gear changes. Not really any ballads on this one. It's just all pretty much go for it. Um, heavy metal is the law. Uh, you know, that fake, live kind of thing those elements like the titles and the fake live stuff that kind of if you know what i'm talking about when you say those things you know what you're in for pretty much by just going through the album titles or the song titles i should say all in all good album a very good debut and it's not surprising it still holds up with fans today i think that if you're into old school metal get onto it uh, eight and a half out of ten from me i picked raid the sky starlight and phantoms of death for my standouts now we're going to do something we've never done before where we are admitting a new contender here we go we've been joined again by the lovely nikki how are you going nikki i'm good hello surprise I'm <laughs> <laughs> so uh we did say at the very top that we'll be bringing people in and out and so nikki's going to join us for for just the one review as part of this special because nikki we haven't seen her for a little while and uh figured it was halloween and you wanted to have some fun with this didn't you nikki i dressed up for the occasion you for did. my one review <laughs> before we go to it did you have any sort of thoughts on the band halloween before we started doing this do you know much about the band at all what's your take on it uh yeah i'd heard them before and i'd actually heard this album before so that was a bit of a win it is a mm-hmm. band that i like and um as someone who claims iron maiden are one of their favorite bands i would say that the vocals and the guitars on the album i'm about to re- review are completely relatable all right cool 
All right. Well, without any further ado, let's get stuck into it so I can keep this train a rolling. We're going to do Halloween with Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1. Uh, 12 tracks for 56 minutes uh, in the expanded edition. I didn't expect everyone to do the expanded edition, but I'm pretty sure that Dave and myself have done those. Um, I don't know. Did you, Dave, or did you not do them? I've heard it. I didn't okay. exactly. No, that's cool. That's cool. Cause I've got them all on Spotify. So I did them all on the expanded editions, but I didn't expect anyone else to do it. Um, anyway, it's the second album from the band released May 1987 via noise records. Uh, produced by Tommy Newton and Tommy Hansen at Horus Sound Studio. This is the band's first with Michael Kiske on vocals, and this was originally intended by the band to be a double album along with part two, uh, but the record label refused. Uh, this is widely regarded as one of the first Euro-style power metal albums. Uh, let's go to you first on this one, Dave. Okay. Out of all the Halloween albums, it's the only one I have on vinyl. Oh, wow. I had to show that off. Picked it up for like seven bucks. Plays really well. Wow, nice bargain. You can plan with that. It was awesome. Okay. Um, They pretty much took what they did on Walls of Jericho, fleshed it out, gave it a bit more breathing space, more dynamics in the process, created a whole new genre called power metal. Can't Mm -hmm. complain with that. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, Apparently, the change in style was partly due to them wanting Michael Kiske to join the band because he wasn't too thrilled with the earlier style of the band. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Been doing some research, so I didn't ever knew that. (laughs) it would have been Bless interesting you, to know. Bless you again, Tim. <laughs> Sorry, <man. laughs> still some freshier songs on this, like Twilight of the Gods. It'd be interesting to know mm-hmm. if Kai Hinton ever demoed the vocals for that. There might be some earlier Something stuff. Something kicking hanging. around on tape somewhere, yeah. Yeah, but there's most of the stuff I think was written with um, just in mind. Mm. Um, they've got very different types of songs on this. You've got the epics, you've got fast and slow, easily accessible hit singles. It just makes for a very diverse listen from track to track. Yeah. Um, Gives you some easy stuff to publish for singles to be, get people to run in and then you get them a full encore, which is always a good way to market your stuff. There's some yep. nice use of um, little sound effects, like um, in a little time. They've got the clocks in the mid section, which is yeah. a bit of extra layers to the song, which is pretty cool, a bit more ear candy. Um, mm-hmm. They're still using a variety of styles in the soloing. You've got the trade off between the two guitarists, and, but they realize they don't have to do that in every single song. Mm-hmm. They breathe a little bit and it's fun. Yeah. Um, the epic track Halloween is mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic songwriting. I think that would be the first very long song I ever heard, and it's obviously okay. had a very traumatic effect on me because I'm a Dream Theater fan now. Yeah, I knew you'd <laughs> like that one. <laughs> yeah, but um, I have another cassette from when I was a kid, the compilation Best of Rest and the Rare. Okay. When I first heard that song, I realized, hey, music, you can actually use it like a movie. You can tell mm-hmm. a story and have different sections. And I think I was 10 again with that, which was very profound for my young musical ears. Wow. Um, but, yeah, the 13 minutes of Halloween never get boring. I've heard that song over and over and over again. Especially Isn't in the, the first song you play every Halloween? Yes, every Halloween yeah. play that song. And the last couple of months I've been trying to learn how to play it, which is driving me slowly insane. <laughs> but we've learned a lot more about the song. That's just the, the, the riff, melodies, the sections – uh, very similar to your normal composition, but they're just a lot longer. And yeah. You repeat it and you go off into a slightly different section, which leads into the next part of the song. Yeah. And it's just very dramatic storytelling with different layers and moods. And there's some very clever harmonized leads throughout there. Um, yeah, great. It's like it would be a highlight for the album for me, but there's so much other cool stuff on there. Yeah. Um, I don't know why Kai Hansen is not more highly regarded as a guitar player and a writer mm, because some yeah. of the stuff he's done on these first three albums, especially, is just amazing. And, and his other stuff on, outside of Halloween's good too. So the gamma ray stuff, yeah, that's mm. that stuff. I just start listening to it because it's very hard to get CDs of that band, so you have yeah. to um, find them on current sites and stuff. <laughs> like that. But yeah, this this album gets ten keys out of ten. Uh, Stand out a little time, Twilight of the Gods, The Tale It Was Bright, Future World, and of course, Halloween. All right. Nicky, we'll make you hold on for a bit longer. Tim, how'd you go with this one? Yes. Uh, the change of vocal is very apparent. Yes. <laughs> you know, you've, got, you've gone to, uh, you've gone from a, a shrieking King Diamond to a, a uh, I don't know, <laughs> Chet. Ch- chanting, chanting medieval Gregorians, <laughs> which is I don't know as a as a, as a uh, non power metal fan, and I always find slightly hilarious. Yeah, which is um, 
like uh, it's like Emma and Emma without the joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's face. <laughs> no, no, but okay, okay. So, uh, but okay. Look, to, to be honest with you, like um, as a going with a more what I would put Halloween albums in three categories, um, which is. The more vocal-driven style, the more guitar-driven style, and the musical theory nerd style. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And I, I, this one is, for mine, firmly in the, the, the vocally-driven style. Yeah. You know, there's... The, the mix-wise, again, the guitars can come a little bit more back and they're just sort of leaning into the, the choruses yeah. a little bit more and really mm-hmm. going for that sing-along stadium moment. Yep. Which is, you know, again, I call it Gregorian chants, but I mean, I like, I, I could sing this. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. Gregorian chants, but different to this. But, but I get what you mean. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, it's, I, I'm joking. I'm joking. But um, you know, it's again, and and you know, and um, yeah, ripping guitar work throughout the whole thing, ripping guitar solos. Um, it's it's what you would expect from an early power metal thing. There's no real weak spots on here. I didn't like the ballad. Okay. I uh, really um again I don't like ballads in general, but I, mm. uh, I don't know. Wasn't okay. a fan of that like, acoustic guitar tone. Just yep. But cool. um the song the song Hel- Halloween, as Dave mentioned, that's a cracker. Mm. Yeah, I haven't I hadn't heard that before, but that's a that's a thirteen minute that flies by. Yeah. Uh, so um Again, you know, again, one of those. I'm not really a power metal guy. I like some albums, but you know, this is worth checking out. Again, yep. it's not. It's not too. It's not too. Uh, you know, you said before. You know, there's always a little bit of a wink and a nod, but it's not too wink yeah. and a nod. It's still a little bit grainy and a little bit. Uh, not over the top. Gritty. Yeah, and like. There's enough. There's enough there to get you get to drag you in. So again, I, I do really like Hall- Halloween. Is obviously the highlight. Yeah, because that's a that's a stunning track. Mm. Um, yeah, eight and a half out of ten. Cool. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. All right. Nice. Nikki, finally your turn. Had to make you sit around oh. for a bit with us. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you guys. Um, you too. I totally enjoyed this album. And as Dave said, it's like, it, it's literally like a movie. It's theatre. It, it really literally takes you on a journey. I already talked about the Iron Maiden vibe I got from the vocals um, and the guitar. Oh, my God, the guitar. <laughs> At the risk of being in me too, uh, Halloween by far is a standout song. I've actually made a comment here that this album is an album of contradictions. And I'll give you the example. Um okay. Yep. Ballad, um, a tale uh, that wasn't right. I'm yep. with Tim. That was probably my least favorite track on the album. But then it's followed by the really upbeat Future World. Future yeah. World. <laughs> like it just gets you going, man. Yep. So you've got light in your shade. It's um pretty controversial there. Um, what's also really trippy is they've got a 13 minute song followed by a one minute 48 song. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No yeah. problem. <laughs> um, overall, I've also given it an 8 out of 10 But I reckon if I just kept listening to it That would go up and up and up yeah. It was an album I was already familiar with But I did repeat play it And every time I repeat played it I definitely got into it just that even bit more Halloween itself is like seven different songs in one There are yeah. so many parts and verses And segues and bridges And things that take you away it never gets boring because it's constantly evolving, and I love it. I, I can listen to that on repeat, no worries at all. Um, my standout songs, which is pretty much half the album, number one, Halloween, I'm Alive. I fucking love that song, man. Every time it comes on, I'm good there. One. It's so good. Future World, I like that. And Follow the Sign, which was that little short song at the end. Okay. I did listen to the extended version and I can't remember the name of the track, so I'm going to get shot by all of you for this. No, but the, um, the very first extra track, it's a remix Victim of, of a- Faith? Victim of Faith? Yes. Yep. I fucking love that song. Yeah. It's so good. Um, I wanted to put that in one of my top songs, but it wasn't technically on the original version, so I didn't. <laughs> but it totally would have been if I could have. So, yeah, I would absolutely recommend you give this a spin like times three. Don't just listen to it once. Mm, Give it a few goes. It's actually really good. It's a yes for me. 
Cool. Now, I think that Halloween in general is a band that you should give more than one pass to any album to, um, except for maybe one or two kind of later on. But, um, mm. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's most of their albums. You've got to. It's worth the time to give it a few spins before you make up your mind about how it sits with you. Um, but this one, compared to the debut, which was much more thrash based, you can hear the step up in the writing, the performances, the production, all sort of stuff. It's it's much more polished overall. Um, it's cool to have uh, two albums in a row, though, from a band with instrumental openings. I don't think I know any other band that does the instrumental opening of an album as often as these guys do it. Uh, vocal switch has been covered off. It's clearer, uh, more precise. It's almost a theatrical vibe on the vocal from um, from Kiski. Uh, it's it's very different to when when Kai Hansen was doing the vocal. It's much more sort of you know gravelly this is much cleaner and i want i don't know about um kiski's gap background i wonder if there is a, a bit of a theater background in his in his singing because it would translate well into what's going on here uh i think that either that or opera yeah yeah, yeah. one of those definitely two would definitely have an impact vibes in there 100 percent. definitely classically trained you'd have to be classically trained to be doing what he's doing on this one um I think the whole thing, the shift on this from style and sound and stuff is a bit of a step in the right direction uh, for what you've got with the lineup of this band. Um, I think that there's more dynamics and drama on this as opposed to direct metal. And whilst I know that some people dropped off later on, this band is taking a step away from what, what else is going on in the 80s and doing something a bit different. And that made them stand out a lot, which is why so many fans liked what they were doing in the early days, at least. Uh, the, the mix is deeper and richer. The backing vocals and the harmonies, which they weren't really doing on the previous record, not to this depth anyway, are, much, are, are a big impact on this too. Uh, I liked the mix and how it kept the energy, but it also kept the grit, but it added the depth and space and panning. Like there was a lot more going on um, with some really good tones in there too that really held up well today. I thought some of the tones in it were glorious. The composition on this was not overly complex by compared by comparison to the debut but it was more interesting if that makes sense like you get to it with you know halloween the the actual title track halloween like the you or the epic sorry that one obviously shows you what they're capable of but around that generally speaking there's a lot more diversity in, in what they're playing with like there were some little bits out of the queen and or pink floyd playbooks for mine which made this much more diverse nothing over the top but it was a natural progression on things and i think having a a dedicated vocalist allowing um kai hansen to focus on the guitar made both of those elements stronger i think the vocals kicked up a notch but so did the guitar work on this record too uh great hooks great depth in the storytelling and the lyrics um i think it's it's time stamped but the the passion and the and just the way it's done is still relevant today and it doesn't sound aged it just has a bit of a time stamp if you liked again like some of the previous i mean if you like the era you're gonna like this one um the epic track halloween is worth the price of entry alone if nothing else you've got to listen to that and this is the one where i started to pick up on king diamond more than the than the first album so that's where tim was mentioning i picked it up a bit more on this in the dramatic sort of flair they've got going on um especially in that song and i liked um the closing element the little one and a half minute track at the very end you know there's a part two coming it's the precursor like that bit at the end of the credits where they they give you the the final slasher kind of scare to let you know you know freddie will be back again in the next movie kind of thing that's the the vibe i got out of that for me uh for me this is just better executed than the debut um but i like both albums a lot this lineup and the writing worked well on this one i think it's, it's a really good album nine out of ten from me Halloween, obviously. Uh, Future World, so there's one for you, Nikki. Um, as well as Twilight of the Gods were my standouts on this one. But I think that's it for you, isn't it, Nikki? That's it. That's it for Nikki. All right, so we'll bid you farewell. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to come in and join us for this one. It's, it's been great to see you. And have... Thank you for having me, and happy Halloween, everyone. Enjoy. <laughs> happy, happy halloween morning. to you and yours as well over there nikki we'll see you again soon hopefully yeah you will all right <laughs> see ya bye later, later. See ya. bye cool all right so now we are doing this sort of stuff for the first time here so i'm <laughs> i'm actually going pretty smoothly this is going a lot more smoothly for me than when i've been trying to get the audio stuff to come through in the in the regular form episodes when there hasn't been when they've been fucking up on me so i've managed to transition this one pretty well so <laughs> I'm pretty happy with what's going on so far. Uh, but now we'll move on to uh, Halloween with Keeper of the Seven, Key, uh, Seven Keys Part 2. 
Uh, this is 15 tracks for 86 minutes for the expanded edition or nine tracks for 49 minutes for the original. Uh, the third studio album, the Gemma Band, released 1988 by, or August 88 by Noise Records, produced by Tommy Newton and Tommy Hansen at Horror Sound Studio. Again, this album was intended, like I said before, to be released with part one. Um, and But upon this release, this was actually quite successful for the band, uh, spawning possibly the most well-known song in I Want Out, because whenever people think of Halloween, they tend to think of that song first and foremost. Um, who went first last time out of you two? Um, Dave. All right, so Tim, you can go first this time. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, yeah, a little bit of a. So were these were these two albums quickly? Were these two albums written together? Yeah, yeah. Written and recorded okay. at the same time, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, because what I was going to say is there are there is obviously a very similar writing st- or a, a similar sound between the two but the writing style is slightly different mm, yeah um again you, you stay again there's a little bit more a little bit more keys and a little bit more organ yep and you're starting to see a little bit more of the uh obviously still very vocal centric but a little bit more leading into the uh the uh musical chops the musical theory nerd Kind of For stuff. me, this is this is the album where if they'd have done it as a double album like they were intending to, this is the one that was supposed to give you the, the bigger kick toward the second half to keep you interested, sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of it's more like there's there's little like like as a as a theory guy, you know, mm. there's little like modal shifts and there's little um, like subtle things to keep you interested there. And it's the sort of one where uh, the more you pay attention to it, the more it's going to give you. Yep. Uh, kind of, kind of an album, and you know, it's because it's obviously, you know, again with this style, it's very easy to get drawn to all the shimmery stuff on top because there's so much of it. Mm-hmm. Again and again, because you know, which is understandable because the vocals are understandably great and there's great lead guitar work, but a lot of the underlying stuff, again, the little when the keys come in, they just put like a like you know the movie soundtrack kind of feel, and you know the the and uh, the, again the subtle modal shifts just going from one just to change it up a little bit change the feel and you know play the same thing just different bits of spots on the spread board uh it's actually really well done and really well put together everything's really well thought out um i don't want to say everything is where it should go because you know they've obviously you know there's been a lot of trial and error going into an album yeah. like this if you know you know mm. let's yeah. see how this sounds let's see how this sounds let's see how this, and then eventually just settling on the right one but yep um, you know, it's it's reward. It's it's a lot of work, and it's you know paid off. Yep. Because again, again, it's a really good listen. I think um, I actually probably prefer this to the first to, to uh, part one. To be honest, yep. again, just because it's more you know again just a taste thing. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I enjoy that that kind of uh, the, the the theory style style of it. But uh, Doctor Stein is my highlight. Yeah. Yeah, eight and a half out of ten. Cool. I'm surprised cool. that, that Doctor that Doc Stein just stand out there. I, yeah, I don't know why I'm surprised. It's just that maybe because it is. Oh, no. Yeah, it's got a big hook. Yeah. yeah. No. Cool. All right, Dave. Yeah. Um, for some people, part two or the sequel will mean like leftover ideas, but this is anything but. Yeah, definitely. Um, these films are just as strong, or even more so in some cases. Mm-hmm. Um, was intended for the double album, so then um, must have been tough to sit on some of these songs when the first time was released, knowing that hey, we've got this great follow up coming, but you mm-hmm. gotta wait. We've been shit couple of them to them. Yeah. Um, but we have some melodic solos, dual harmonies, guitar lines, all as expected. Um, it's interesting that Tim said about the the music theory nerd part of this because in some parts this one's a lot more accessible than the first album. Possibly because it's got I One Out. And as Andrew said, it's the single that most people think about when they hear the name. Yeah. Because it was such a successful song. And this album, I think, outsold the first one. I think so. so. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the favorite. This was like their too. breakthrough. Like the first one was all received, and this one was one that put them over. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, we got the right. It's just a great mid mid album highlight. The vocal mm. performance really brings out the song to life, and it's a really good section. I think it would be the first song of. Side two, if you were to flip it over, it could be the last one. I don't know, I don't know if I'm buying one, unfortunately. I think it's the last one. I don't have the record. I've got to find it. Yeah. Um, I only just noticed, I don't know what I've been paying attention to all these years, but the um, horns that are used at the end of the song, Eagle Fly Free, it's very 
subtle, but enough to just give that final dramatic part to the song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really, really well. Mm-hmm. And that's when every instrument gets a chance to shine in that. I mean, I tend to focus on the vocals and the guitars, but the bass and drums throughout all their stuff, but that song in particular just really steps out. Mm. Uh, got to credit the artwork, which is yeah. amazing. I think that was like <laughs> some of the pioneering stuff for the power metal genre. Yes. Which now it gets a little bit silly after all these years, but the original stuff is amazing. All, um, just about all their artwork's really good, actually. Yeah, there's been some great stuff, but just power metal in, in general, yeah, there's some really odd stuff out there. Yep. Um, big catchy choruses. These songs remain live favorites for decades for a reason. It's great. Mm-hmm. Song uh, the epic title track, People of the Seven Keys. Um, it's epic like Halloween, but it's not like they're just recycled ideas of how to structure the song. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of fresh ideas, and this goes into what Tim was saying about the guitar theory and music theory. But um, there's a lot more tempo changes and time signature changes in that, but it works to serve the feel and the flow and the storytelling which is used really well. Mm. Um, overall, this album gets another 10 keys out of 10. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> Eagle Fly 3, Dr. Steen, we've got the right. I want out and keep it the seven keys. Cool. Um, so for me, this one definitely sort of flowed straight on. You could tell this was meant to be the part two of the of the first one where I said, you know, the last one, the... the um, the end credits little moment to, to fill you, you know, to let you know the next one was coming. This sort of kicks in and goes bang right where it left off. Um, the songwriting and the overall structure of this album is a bit different to the first one though. I think they've seen it a bit more accessible. I think this was, you've still got all your, the writing and stuff going on underneath it, but the general aspect of these songs is a bit more straight ahead and a little bit more widely accessible. It's still technical and done, does all the things that, that Tim was talking about. I just think that there's the way this is a bit more, streamlined and like i said before it's like it's meant to be the thing if you're taking both of these at the same time as you know part one and part two then this is the part that's going to be a bit more up tempo overall to sort of make people stay interested for the whole duration of the combined listen um i'll get to the bonus tracks first off in theory they're a good addition but they do stretch this album out by a long way listening to it today uh this, they're worth checking out just like they were on the previous one but i'm not sure the remixes really bring anything much to this listen i yeah, it's nice to have it but whatever you don't really need it but this one like i was saying um like i feel like it's more accessible but it's also which is going to sound really strange now i say it now it's also more ambitious than the last there's a lot more going on in terms of the sounds being used in particular the horns the choral effects other things around that too and it's much bigger in overall scope while keeping with the tone of the last record the mix is well done nice with the pan layering also stuff which is good for this nothing too dramatic but everything is done well and it holds up after all this time and while this is the longer of the two albums, this the songs themselves feel shorter and sharper, which is where it feels like it's more accessible to me. So while it's a bit more ambitious because it's shorter and sharper kind of thing, it, you get through a song and you get into the next song um, fast, which makes it a bit more or easier to take in, even though it's a longer listen kind of a thing for me. Um, what this does give you overall, I think, is a much better appreciation of what this could have been as a double album. So if it had been the four discs released at the same time, this listening to it like this today gives you an appreciation of what that would have accomplished. And I think that would have been, for a second album, think about that, that would have been huge for a band. Change the singer and do this as a double album for the for mm. effectively the re-debut of the band. That's huge. They did a lot of good work on this one. Um, I love the performances, love the writing. Um, overall, this is more straight ahead, like I was saying, a bit less bombastic than before, but everyone gets to flash, um, but everything serves the songs nicely, and as a consequence, the album, there's little foley touches on this as well. There's a lot more going on on this one. Long story short, if you liked the the last album or the description that any of us are given of this record here, you're pretty much going to like this record too. Um, where part one was more dramatic, this one's a little more accessible while showing more flair in the composition at the same time, which is a really neat trick. It's a bit more direct, but the energy is fantastic along with just little touches that just make it, I don't know, you knew they were sort of holding on to these songs. Like like you were saying, imagine trying to sit on these songs for a year, knowing you've got these ones in the can after you release the first one as well. Like that'd be challenging. So well done all now. I don't think you can split these albums anymore. I think they're both on a par for mine. Um, each are great on their own, but I think it's just a great combined listen too. If you like guitars and melody, you should be all over these two records if you're not already. Uh, and this is probably the more fun of the two where the other one is a bit more sort of serious. But still, 9 out of 10 from me. Um, March of Time, uh, I Want Out, and Keeper of the Seven Keys. I, it's funny because I don't 
I'm not normally the world's biggest fan of the epic tracks, but for this band, it seems to be a trend that I'll continue on with for quite some time where those epics just can't seem to keep rising to the top for mine. But we'll go on to the, uh, the last one with Tim for a little while. We'll get him back later on after we do this one, but we're going to move on to Pink Bubbles Go Ape now. Um, and this is 15 tracks for six minutes on the expanded edition uh the original was 11 tracks for 44 minutes the fourth studio album from the band released march 1991 via emi uh produced by chris sangaris and the band at puk studios this is the band's first release on a brand new label and it's also the first with roland grapov on guitar after kai hansen left the band um after the last tour i think he, he ended up leaving the band on at the end of the last tour before they went to the studio to do this one so dave let's go to you first on this Right from the start and the title track, uh, no, the title of the album, you know this is going to be different from what we've had on the previous three albums. It's a very odd name to name a heavy metal album. Yeah. I think they're going for abstract because that gives a whole preconceived notion of what you're going to expect when you... Yeah, interesting. Do, yeah, interesting to say the least. <laughs> uh, I know it should be all about the music, but presentation is a big thing. Mm-hmm. And... There's no pumpkin on the logo. It's a bobble. Mm-hmm. And if anyone remembers that episode of the Osbournes where they were showing Ozzy the setup for the stage and there's a bobble machine. You know. <laughs> and he goes, I don't want bobbles. I want evil. What's fucking evil about a bunch of bobbles? <laughs> I'm the prince of fucking darkness, Sharon. <laughs> when do the male strippers come out? Yep. Fuck. <laughs> some, it gets worse. There's some guy in the back who's like, giving himself a wash and there's this woman is about to deep throw the fish. I don't know what the hell I don't know what they were thinking. It's a bizarre album. And, yeah. And then you put it on. And I know it's supposed to be about the music, but fuck me, the first track is fucking terrible. I don't know if it was meant to be a joke or if there were I don't know, but it just blows your perception of what you're gonna get. So if you're listening to this for the first time, skip the first track. Because probably a good idea actually. Yeah, when you get to Kids of the Century, that's a good song. That's where the album starts. Ignore the cover, ignore the opening. The songs start from Kids of the Century. It's, it's kind of like coming into Pink Floyd at Pigs on the Wing. Yeah. <laughs> Which wouldn't make sense if you didn't know the band, but yeah. Yeah. The departure of Kai Henson is very evident. There's a lot less solos. And while it is a long song, it's not epic in composition like it was before. Mm. You can tell he was very much a driving force for this band. I mean, they went from evil to bubbles. <laughs> it's still upbeat, fun metal. These songs are nowhere near as gauging as engaging as their own previous albums. And they've abandoned the cartoony horror fantasy in favor of heavy metal hamsters. Mm-hmm. Well, Isn't yeah. a bad song, but it's a very silly title. I think heavy metal hamsters was actually about their old record label. Could be, yeah. It was yeah. meant to be a blue side. So maybe yeah. it should have been the beef side. But I've actually got a standout on this album. So like I said, it, it's a silly song, but it's yeah. not bad. Okay. And speaking of a bad song, the song number one. They've done very upbeat, optimistic, empowering songs before. But fuck, this could have been written by Beyonce. <laughs> terrible. It's too much on that side. I like that one. It's horrible. Okay. <laughs> Um, the vocals are good, but there's nothing truly outstanding like he did on previous releases. It made me go, well, he's really up there. Mm. It's confident and it's impressive, but there's nothing really outstanding. It's not terrible. It's not great. It's experimental. It's abstract uh, at the loss of a family member and the loss of who they were. I think they're trying mm. to find their feet again. There's some good songs, but they was do. a big loss. Yeah. And there is some good songs, but they get lost the most presentation some of the silliness and some of the experimentation mm. um i gave it six and uh yeah, six and a half bubbles out of ten um the stand up were kids of the century heavy metal hamsters mankind which was an epic but not as good and the chance which is actually probably the best one on this album that's a really good one cool all right tim where'd you land with this one um so again quick question um like blue suede shoes and all that. Is that yeah. supposed to be on here? <laughs> that's the um that's the extended version. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Just wondering. They're not on the original edition, they're on the extended version. Oh, well, I thought not. Uh, yeah. no, it doesn't make much sense. <laughs> okay, yes, it does not make sense at all. Um 
uh, again, I got into this, you know, not knowing the history of the band, but uh, when you said the the song that everybody knows is on the last album, that actually makes perfect sense for this album because uh, definitely more of a rock album than a metal album, and yeah. it feels like, especially for the first half, they're just fishing for that radio single. Yeah. And again, if they got a little bit of a taste of it last time, you know, they're looking at uh, at, at this point when when you're when you're a band and you're signed to a label, it's all about the second single. And if you can get the second single, then you then you're off for the races. And uh, that's what it feels like they're looking for here, at the expense of everything else. And I think you know, frankly, it's a bit swing and a miss. Um, actually, that's a bit harsh. As hit and miss is sort of what I was going for. Yeah. Uh, some of those tracks are really strong, you know, like, again, that opening, like, 30 seconds is weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Kids of the Century is a great track. And, I mean, there's a few great tracks all over here. But I think, you know, for the most part, it's just like, yeah. Again, if you like, uh, you know, I don't know, big glam rocky choruses, then go mm-hmm. for it. But if you're looking for a a Halloween album or, you know, something similar to the first three albums and, you know, step over it and go to the next one. Oh, I wouldn't go to the yeah. one after this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll wait for you guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, six out of ten. Kids of the Century is a highlight. Yeah, take it or leave it. Yeah. All right. Um. Yeah, if, you, if you're not happy with this one, don't go to the next one. Maybe go to the one after that. You might be a bit happy with the one after that. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> This is a different beast, which has been covered off. Uh, I can see why this didn't jump out in the in the polling because it is in the audience polling because it's it's a gear change. There's some ballsy riffs and and the vocals cut through as you expect from this band. It's still built around those two elements. It's less flash playing, but the guitar you know is still along with the vocal the, the driving influence of what's you know pushing these songs along. There are some stylistic shifts on this. The guitar work is more rock than metal, which has been covered. Um, still great stuff it's less attacking and the use of the feel is different on this one compared to the previous records and the sound is shifted as well which different label different producer you're going to get that uh, it's a little more spread out sonically that the, the space of the mix was different um, but everything else but everything overall was really really clear crystal clear and, and had nice warm overall tone this one like I said before the band was sort of like that cross between early Metallica and early Iron Maiden this one feels a bit more like a Dio album um in the way it's presented and all sort of stuff. It, it was just a different vibe to it. The use of the groove, the tempo, those were different on this as well. Um, there was some al- almost Pink Floyd use of space in tracks like number one. And there were other things like I got a bit of Trans-Siberian Orchestra and other elements of this as well. Like they've started to, to broaden their horizons. Um, there's more diversity in the tones, um, less layering and synth work, but more pulling the different sounds in the studio kind of thing. Now you get some twangy slappy bass kind of stuff, which I haven't heard yet from this band too. So they're definitely trying to find some different things in the studio to play with. I think this is still a Halloween record, but they've expanded um, beyond what they've done before. And the new lineup and producer have definitely left a mark on this. It's not bad. It's just hard to live up to what the last three delivered as well. Like you're always going to have, you've had three really good albums. You've lost probably one of your most important composing element of it and you're going to have a dip at some point um where the first f- first albums were immediately impacting this one's a bit more of a grower this is a lot more 80s influence as well which is weird because it was later it was almost like they were trying to get a bit of a, this a, almost thrown back a little bit in, in time for it i don't know because this is crossing over into that 80s to 90s thing this one just felt more 80s maybe that's the rock vibe of it versus the metal vibe i don't know it was it was just a weird little thing that they've started off me, it, it felt like a that 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 weird early 90s period of glam metal yeah where they're trying yeah. to where they're trying to just yeah stave off the grunge yeah kind of like what poison were doing i guess in a lot of respects yeah it's it's a very again they're fishing for that single mm. Yeah, no, you're probably right. That's probably where the 80s sort of thing comes into mind as well because the, the 80s pop kind of side of it. I thought the album flowed well. It was good dynamics. Leaving the ballad um, to the end. That was the end track, wasn't the ballad on this one to run with the pack? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that, Blue Sweat Shoes was after that. Yeah, yeah, that was it. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. It was, um, where is it then? It was Your Turn is the one I'm thinking of. Sorry, going through the track list. Um, yeah, that was... 
that was a good trick, leaving the ballad toward the end. All in all, I think it's a solid album. Um, I didn't dislike it as much as you guys. I actually did enjoy it. Um, I think the bonus tracks on this were the least valuable so far. The covers just didn't make any sense. Like you've got um, Blue Suede Shoes, Shit and Lobster, Le Hem Bourgeois, Walkways, and To Run With The Pack. Oh, I don't know what the fuck is going on with those ones. They're, yeah, whatever. Not really important, but they're, you know, okay, you got them. All in all, their fourth album is a growing kind of a pains record, but I think um, they're getting a little bit more mature as they go through it too. It's worth checking out. It doesn't hit the heights of the previous ones. It is a solid record though. Um, and it's just already that you've got a pretty high bar with this band for the previous three records. I gave an eight out of 10. Someone's Crying, Mankind and Kids of the Century were my standouts on this one. So I think for now, we'll uh, temporarily bid farewell to Tim. Uh- and How many albums you got to go? About a half dozen. All right. Um, All right. Do you want me to message you directly? <laughs> yes. All right. I'll message you directly when we're getting close to having you back in. All right. All right. And then I'll jump back in. <laughs> all right. Cool. So, so we'll let, see let, you all. Let, hey? See you, see you yes, soon so then, man. I'll let you in. Yep. yep. I'll let you in. You don't need to get out. You can just sort of go and do your own thing and we'll, uh, we'll get you back very, very soon. I'll send you a direct message on Messenger and we'll get you back. Perfect. All right, cool. We'll see you again soon. Cheers for that, Tim. See ya. See ya, Tim. All right. And then there were two. There were two. For a little while. So now, uh, while we move along, we're going to move on to uh, the one that we've been sort of waiting for in both good and bad ways with this one. We're going to go on to Chameleon now. Uh, 20 tracks for 112 minutes on the expanded edition. It was 12 tracks for 71 minutes on the original. The fifth studio album from the band released May 1993 via EMI, produced by the band Tommy Hansen and Michael Tibes or at Chateau de Pape in Germany, while mixed at Scream Studios in Los Angeles. This album was a commercial and critical failure. It was also the last with, mo- uh, with vocalist Michael Kiss and drummer uh, Indo Schwitzenberg, I think his name was. I don't know. My spell check has corrected things for me, so it's a little bit fucking weird. But yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just us. So Dave, over to you. I don't have this on CD. I, I'm a not reason. surprised. No. <laughs> uh, the pumpkin is back in the logo on the cover, though. For this album, it really doesn't belong on it at all. Yeah. I, First heard this when it came out in 93. I remember asking, what the hell happened to this band? And 27 years later, I put it on for this review. And the first song, first time, wasn't bad. It was good. Mid-tempo, a rocker, decent solo. Yep. Maybe the album isn't as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> when the sinner comes on, fucking yes, it is as bad as I remember it. <laughs> this isn't power metal. This isn't oh, even metal. This is pop. This is Bad pop at that. Mm. When your band is called Hell a Wing with a E mm-hmm. instead of an A, you have yeah. a certain expectation of what you're about, whether you're doing out and out horror or you're doing happy, happy Halloween fun time. With Chameleon, they kind of forgotten about Hell and they just focused on the Wing. And we've already <laughs> done a shit alternative band called Wing. We don't <laughs> need Halloween doing that. Wow. Song Revolution now sounds like Pearl Jam at places. And the lyrics, the lyrics, if you're going to San Francisco, mm. it's Halloween, I want metal. I don't want hippie shit. Yeah, that was Not a weird. For a very, very long song, it's boring. Mm-hmm. And they're good at writing long, interesting songs. Yeah. The song music is long as well, long and boring. They're uh, jazz styles on here and there were some horns and i don't mind jazz not on a halloween record and it's not done very well it's experiment experimentating for the sake of experimentation and it just doesn't work yeah now giants is an okay song and i picked that as a highlight that was good after after listening to all the halloween albums and going back to just that song it's not that great actually it's just the best of a really bad bunch now, Windmill is an okay song, but not for Halloween. It just doesn't suit them. Oh, it's, yeah, no, that one bugged me. I didn't like that one. Yeah, they've done good slow ballads further into their career, but this one just doesn't work for some reason. It's not a good song. And it's the drummer used to call it It's just an odd song. Yeah, the drummer would call it Chipmill. It's part, probably part of the reason he left the band. Yep. 
overall, for music, it's not terrible, but for a Halloween album, it's not good. Mm. And personally, I think Michael Kiske had to go. If you listen to the solo stuff he did directly after leaving the band, it's not really metal. It's more... Yeah, there was a lot going on. And yeah, yeah there was a lot of infighting in different fractions within the band. So yep. they definitely had to make a choice. And I think they made the right one so they could yep. focus on being a metal band again. I gave this two tiers out of 10 because I don't want to cry no more. <laughs> uh, I stand up for the first time because of my initial reaction and the song Giants, which okay. isn't that great. See, for me, I get to come into this one differently because I haven't got an emotional attachment to this band. So <laughs> for me, hearing it the first time doing this, it's also the first time I've heard the debut album and all the albums apart from the last one and the and the two Keepers albums that, that everyone knows and loves. So I don't I, – and I knew that talking to you beforehand that this was going to be a bit of a shock and you read up on it and you know you're going to be in for a surprise. So everyone's painted this as an absolutely horrible album and I'm going with a really low fucking bar. It's not a great album, don't get me wrong, but it's not as shocking as I thought it was going to be. Where they were dipping their toes last time with a bit of experimentation on the last album, they just dove head fucking first in on this and they went all over the shop. Um, this is much more pop radio, uh, very 80s, very friendly sort of stuff. Um, I know the album is hated by the fans, but like I said, for me, it's not the emotional side of it. So I don't, I don't, I don't fault it as heavily as other people do. What you can't fault in that regard is the performances and the talent. Like that sort of stuff is here. Um, it's the same across the board. All their stuff is the same. There's fantastic stuff in that regard. Musically, this is parts of the past scattered throughout it, um, but for the most part, it's a pretty far departure from anything done before. You still get guitar and vocals, but now it's things like synth and strings and horns and woodwinds and pianos and all sorts of stuff and different musical styles in there, what's driving this work they wanted to get some shit out of the system and boy did they do it um this is anything from metal to acoustic to honky tonk influence stuff um on this it's pretty disjointed as an overall listen this feels more like a michael bolton record than a halloween record for me uh the chameleon concept of changing their stripes between every single song makes this challenging to sit through especially for how long it is as well and while the composition is good, this album does suffer from long songs, making this an extremely long album. There are certain refrains on this that just didn't need to be there. They could have been cut and made this whole thing a lot shorter. It was unnecessary to have the length that it was on this record. Going back to Tommy Hansen as a producer, definitely works for this band. Uh, he, he brings out the tones and depth and all sorts of stuff you want from these guys. Everything is crystal clear and balanced. It's hard to fault the production along with the performances directly. Um, and it's held up pretty well over the years too. And the use of Foley sound effects, that sort of stuff, actually, you know, it works well in this. Um, the technical aspect of this record was very, very well done. It's one of the most mixed bag albums though I've ever come across in my life. It's easy to see why this alienates the fans so much, Dave being a case in point. Um, it's hard to stay focused on this record because there is so much going on. And it's funny how this one feels even more eighties than they, their debut record. I suppose they're coming up on 10 years as a band at this point in time. So maybe they're feeling a bit nostalgic, but this one feels so eighties. It's not funny. And it's what mid nineties I think it was. So it's crazy. Um, the funny thing here is that across the two discs in the expanded edition, there's probably enough to make one decent, decent sort of cohesive 45 to 50 minute record. If, the, if you cut the shit out of it, you might get a decent record. I think they just picked the wrong ones in the end um, to go on the main record because on the bonus tracks, there's actually some good songs in there for fans put off by this one. It might be worth actually checking out the bonus tracks more than the original or the album picture choices. Cause there's more of what you expect from Halloween on that side of things. I don't know if you've checked out much of those, Dave, but I think those no, ones have a bit <laughs> Maybe check them out and see what you think because the bonus tracks are a bit more in what you're expecting out of Halloween. You know, you get past the actual album, you get into this other stuff. It's like, oh, hang on. It's a bit more what I was expecting to get. All in all, while each individual song is probably well done on its own, it's a bit much as an overall product. So I gave it a five out of 10. I picked, I believe, Step Out of Hell and First Time. Step Out of Hell has got a good hit, good hook. That, that, that stays with that one. Very, very 80s, but yeah, it, it stays with you. Um, but yeah, like you also picked first time. But then we move on. 
as does the band and we go into a much better direction with this one with master of the rings or theoretically a much better direction uh 18 tracks for 84 minutes on the expanded edition or 11 tracks for 50 on the original uh sixth studio from the band released july 1994 via raw power castle communications produced by tommy hansen at the band again at chateau de Pape in germany this is the first album with andy derris on vocals and uli kush on the drums so yes they had to make some changes after the last one clearly and Let's see how they went with that on this one. Dave. Cool. Halloween Reborn. New yep. lineup, new sound, new direction. Bit less power metal and a bit back to the straight up heavy metal, mm. but this band is fun again. Uh, back to the energetic riffs and the uh, melodic lines. It's not as frantic or epic as what they did on the Keepers album, but they're still very well crafted songs. Mm. Um, Dursey's voice fits the band perfectly. I'm going to have to practice his name. Dursey's. <laughs> Andy the new, singer's voice, the new singer's voice fits the band perfectly. I like that they brought him in as a songwriter as well. He's not just mm. a hired singer. He actually gets to contribute and he brings a whole new dynamic to the band. Yeah. One that they continue to work on for the next 28 years, wherever long it's been yeah. since they released it, 26. But he does a great job with all the um, Kiski tracks as well when he does them live. Yeah. Underrated, um, I think, as a singer. He really is. And he's mm. improved over time too. Mm. Uh, there's a ballad on this, probably the first really good ballad Halloween had done, and not just like a slow song. This is an acoustic song in the middle yeah. of a heartbeat. And yeah. I think you know, he brought that song in. It works really well. Good song. And, yeah, it's a Halloween song for sure, and yeah. it worked where Windmill fell miserably on the previous album. Yeah. Uh, nice use of the video game sounds during the song The Game Is On. Yeah. Nice they used to use on the Keeper album, so they just realized what they were good at and started bringing yeah. some of that fun element back. Overall, it's a very great, diverse album and a great way to rebuild their career. Also, this was released in 1994 when a lot of bands were either softening or slowing down or bringing the grunge elements in. Mm. Halloween just went back to being a metal band again. Yep. They released an album they can certainly be proud of. Um, I give this eight rings out of ten. <laughs> I stand up to the Soul Survivor, where the, ring, where the Rain Grows, Why, Perfect Gentleman, and In the Middle of a Heartbeat. Cool. Perfect Gentleman's got a great hook in it. That, that one. is cool. Yeah, the live version that comes up on a record later on is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, look, like we've t- we've talked about it, like the new singer, new drummer, and new label yet again. From the opening with the little instrumental track again at the start of the album, you feel like they're like at the very start with the instrumental album. It just feels like the band is back on this one. Um, I don't know what went on with the band behind the scenes, but this one is much more riff driven. Back to that intensity you want. The change in vocalist has impacted the overall tone. It's a little bit grittier again, as opposed to the clean polish that was done with Kiski on vocals. This feels like a heavier version of early Europe. So before the final countdown, that that Europe back before final countdown, it's a heavier version of that kind of thing. So it's getting much more into the European styling again as well. And it's, you know, getting back to its roots a bit more. It's less fun in feel overall. It is still fun. It is still Halloween, but there's less fun. It's a bit darker overall. Uh, it's, it's, it's got, that thrashy element of the uh, debut album, but they've still got the big melodies and the big hooks, which is very, very cool. It's less bombastic in the production, the composition, which is a welcome relief after the last couple of albums too, to be honest. Um, you still get little things here and there, but this is much more straight ahead. This is just the, the right amount of stuff used here and there to bring the thing to life, add a little sparkle to it, but the rest of it is just fucking going to try and kick you in the head as much as it possibly can with this lineup. Uh, I like the production on this, not as punchy, perhaps the vocals are back a little bit. It might be a case of them not being as confident with trying to put Darius out the front as they were with Kiski at the front, but the bass being put up along with some of the layering on this actually means like the, the layering was done pretty well. It's a different kind of mix for this. And while it's aged uh, possibly worse than previous records, you know, in the grand time of things, it does work overall for the vibe so the, the the bottom end being a bit more focused on on this one actually gives it that darker and grittier feel which brings you back to reality a bit with this band and where you had chameleon before this is a much stronger return to form in all those regards and i thought the use of groove on this was really cool too we haven't really had a lot of groove based stuff until this sort of point from the band for mine and this goes with that straight ahead approach it works really well and it's that whole thing about you know it's not only riffs and melody, but also leaning on the rhythm a bit more this time around, which sort of throws back to the early sort of thrashier tone of things. Um, a lot of changes have happened over the years, but this one feels genuine and organic again, not being contrived or forced like the previous record was. Uh, this time around, the bonus tracks actually felt like they added something tangible. They're not strictly required, but they are very cool. The, the There's a cover of Cold Sweat, Dave. If you haven't checked that out, 
that, that's really cool. They did they do some very good covers, which we'll get to more of that later on as well. You've got it on there, have you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now that was a very good cover. Um, look, basically after Chameleon, this is a welcome return to form and gives you hope for what's yet to come. Because I'm going through these ones in order, so I haven't heard any of like. My, I haven't heard this one or the previous two albums before going through this process. So this was like, okay, cool. This isn't going to be a complete you know, mess after this point <laughs> in time. It gave me a bit more hope to go into. So this is very, very cool. I enjoyed the energy on this record. Uh, eight and a half out of 10 from me. Why, where the rain grows and still we go for my standouts on this record. Nice. So now we move on yet again. We're going to keep flying through this one so we can get Tim back and not have him waiting for forever and a day for us. Um, we're going to go with, sorry. Aha, forever in the day. (laughs) (laughs) Time now for the time of the oath. This is 20 tracks for 91 minutes on the expanded edition, uh, 12 tracks for 61 minutes on the original. The seventh album from the band released March 1996 by Victor Entertainment and Castle Communications. Produced by Tommy Hansen at Chateau de Pape in Germany. Again, this album is a concept album based on the works of Nostradamus. and is also the first album which all five members of the band get writing credits. Uh, the album was dedicated to the memory of former drummer Ingo Schwichtenberg, who committed suicide the previous year as well. All right, over to you, Dave. This could almost be the darker, wicked stepsister of Master of Rings. Yeah. Following along the same Pretty idea, good. but fleshing out the sound a bit without straying too much from the path and alienating fans again. Mm. Just um, with a tour and an album under their belt with Jersey, then they found out what they're good at and how they yeah. can work really well together, and they've just polished that. And overall, it's a little bit darker than the first one. So they're yep. more into the creepy element of Halloween. and But it's still fun. Um, very diverse collection of songs, ranging from the rockers to the metal to the epic to the power ballads. Yeah. Um, less cartoonish horror, for lack of a better term. It's a bit more grown up and serious. They're yeah, definitely. Their awesome. career and they're a bit hunkered down and focusing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mission Motherland is the epic track on this in the new... Yeah experienced and mature style and that's really well done it's it is long and epic it's well constructed and yeah hats off to it for that one mm-hmm. i used to prefer the master of the rings album but over the years i tend to lead more to this one i think they okay. really it's a bit of a grower to start with it's not as accessible as the previous one but there's yep. some fun stuff on here uh it could also depend on your mood if you want dark halloween go this yeah. one if you want happy happy halloween master of the rings yeah. Um, track order. I love that they keep the title track to the end. It's a very nice closure to the album. Mm-hmm. Got a bit yep. of menace to it as well. And the artwork is great. I love how they use to keep a character, but they put the rings in the middle. It kind of brings the yeah. old school, the new They're school. They're tying things over, which is very smart. Yeah. Mm. Very well done. Um, I gave this nine oaths out of ten. They stand up for uh, We Burn Power for Everyone One Before the War, Mission Muffler, and Time of the Oath. Cool. Well, like you were saying, this one's darker and grittier right from the start. There's an evil edge to this one. The lyrics are invested in that regard, so they're definitely going down that path. It's it's more up tempo class up tempo classic metal loaded with lead guitar work, the riffs, the melody. It's not overly complicated, but it's all very 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 well written and performed. I like the rhythm section on this one. This followed on from the previous album where the rhythm section got some really cool gro- groove going. The use of the lower ranges on across the board, but particularly in the vocals as well. As the overall dark tone of this, it's a shift, but one that works well for what they and it works well with what they're going for on this one. The whole concept idea too. Production is a bit deadened off, which ties into that vibe. Um, it's another shift that makes sense in context, but it's probably aged this one a little more harshly than any of the other records to date. It doesn't sound as vibrant because they have deadened off a lot of the top end on it. Um, it just took the life out of it for me. It's not a bad thing. It still sounds good. It's just that, you know, me being fussy, that's what I do. Um, the Around that, though, it's pretty well balanced overall. There's some nice depth and space. The softer moments, when they really, they have some soft moments in this, which really ring out nicely, and the punchy moments just kick through enough to sort of keep it interesting for you. I'd consider this one to be more of a theme record than a direct concept, if that makes sense. It's like they've... Um, <laughs> There's not really a continuous narrative. It's like they've gone through the Nostradamus quatrains and just picked out bits and pieces and just gone, okay, we'll build a song out of this or that and stuck them all together as a concept album. It's more of a theme than a concept, so to speak. Uh, but overall, it flows pretty nicely. The use of peaks and troughs to make the album interesting and not drag is very well done. There's not as much fun on this one. Like you got the more fun on the previous record again, but this one does have some nice gear changes. You get some energy to go along with that darker, more somber and slower side of this band. Really good use of light and shade overall. And this one for me grew 
more and more over time too. So the more I listened to this, the more I came to enjoy it. Probably the least amount of sonic experimentation as well. So you haven't got the horns and the strings stuff going on. They've usually added those layers in. They haven't really gone for that this time around, um, which is odd considering it's a concept record and that would help to break it up a bit, but it is still, you know, it's more of a streamlined thing, which also does work for them too. The band are comfortable. You can feel they're more comfortable with who they are now. Like you said, they've done an album, done a tour. They know who they are. They know what they're good at and they're settling into a rhythm now. Um, they're still finding ways to be ambitious yet cohesive. It's a solid album without tearing the walls down. And by this point in time, I'm just going to say they're adding some very good covers to their library in this point. Their take on Electric Eye is very, very cool. Um, not overly different, but it's very well done. I did mm. enjoy that. Um, as for the original bonus tracks, you can see why they didn't make the album. Um, but they're not, they're not duds. They're just not anything that sort of jumps out at you either. It's a really good solid album that if anything shows you how well this lineup has really clicked on this release. 8 out of 10 from me. Uh, Mission Motherland, I think you picked that one as well, didn't you? Yep. Like I said, I'm going for the epics with this band, which is a, a, a theme I didn't expect to have happen for me because I'm usually struggling a bit with that. But I knew, I figured you would go for them, but I, I'm surprised how many of those I've picked. So yeah, Mission Motherland, The Time of the Oath, and Steel Tormentor were my standouts on this one. So now we're going to move on to uh, Better Than Raw. Um, wherever my notes are, there we go. So this is 15 tracks for 73 minutes for the expanded edition, 11 tracks for 53 minutes for the original, the eighth album from the band released April 1998 via Castle Communications, produced again by Tommy Hansen and the band at Chateau de Pape and Crazy Cat Studios in Germany. Also Misueno Studio in Spain, uh, mastered by Ian Cooper. This one sees the band stepping away from the concept idea begun in the first one and moving back into the more contemporary world with their songs. Dave. Um, everything you would expect on a Halloween album, only bigger. Okay. Much bigger. Uh, this is the best of the new lineup so far. Uh, the pumpkin in the Halloween logo now has an evil grin. So yeah. A little bit. But I think that's the logo they've kept until now, isn't it? Just about. Yeah, yep. yeah pretty much. Um, by 1998, the metal genre had become a lot darker than it was in the 80s. Mm. And with Better Than Raw, Halloween managed to adjust to the times while still being who they are. And there's a bit of humor in the darkness is this, this yeah. one as well if you love the harmonized dual guitar solos there is some killer stuff on this track um there's some very cool use of gang vocals as on the song falling higher that chorus is pretty cool yep uh, the two the two singles um hey lord and i can uh, they're very obvious that they yeah. were in a bit the singles that kind of changes the mood on the album a little bit but it still flows pretty well but there's some pretty cool songs i think the production is a little bit more polished on those as well to make yeah. them a bit more a different, they're a brighter vibe yeah definitely a lot of that comes down to the melodies on that which i thought was really yeah. pretty well done they swung um, the fence on those two songs yeah that was good yeah. uh, revelation is the epic track on this album and it's quite different to the other epic tracks they mm. always do not just long songs for the sake of long songs but they've got good ideas that just flow easily that same sound laborious to listen to mm. there's always a point yeah, they don't fall into a formula. Mm. And there's a couple of odd time signatures changes in that too, which I always like. Yep. And in the middle, there's this section where it's just a guitar chord and then a drum roll, and then they just repeat that over and over. Yeah. And then it just grabs your attention. It's like, okay, you got my attention. Where are you going with this? Mm. Not many bands have that type of breathing space. So I thought it was yeah. really well done. They resisted the urge to overplay. Yeah, exactly. And it just draws you into the song. Yep. Um, this lineup can certainly play, and it makes me wonder why they never played Halloween or Keeper of the Seven Keys during this era in the live shows. Mm. It would have been interesting, but I suppose they were just focusing on the new direction of only playing the hit songs. Yeah, uh, It's an enjoyable album from start to finish. The only thing I can really fault, there's a vocal effect on his vocals in Push in the verse, mm. and it's really distracting. I don't think it was needed, but I think they were just going with some modern production tricks to kind yeah. of draw in. It wasn't over the top, but yeah, a taste thing. If you don't, you don't like that stuff anyway, so it's going to irk yeah. you regardless. Yeah. If it works, it works, but this one I just don't think it was necessary. Mm. Um, I started writing out standouts for this album, but after seven songs, in order, I realized I was just writing out the track list. So 10 pumpkins out of 10, every song's a standout. This is fantastic. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, again, this is back to the instrumental opening and then some pretty pounding metal. There's a bit of a Judas Priest vibe in this one yeah. at this point in time. So they're managing to go along through the years and change themselves 
apart from some certain outlier albums like Chameleon, no, they over the journey they've they've managed to sort of move with the times, but also keep the old school elements there. So they've gone from you know Iron Maiden, Metallica, Dio. And now we're getting a bit of Priest. We've had some King Diamond. And those, like we're getting a lot of the really classic sort of stuff going through, but this still always sounds like Halloween, which is really really good. Uh, the vocal vocals are back a little on this with the mid range is pushed forward. Um, it's a bit of a meteor mix overall in the previous record. All these shifts in tones across the albums are pretty subtle, but when you take it in on a listen back to back to back, like we're doing for this process or like I did anyway, you notice those things and it works well. I think that it's a punchy mix, but it's well balanced. I enjoyed how they layered in some different textures on this, things like the stripped back cleaner tones, especially in the guitar, worked really well. The use of string and synth, synth moments were good. Added some sparkle, just the right amount to this record. Not a lot has changed musically overall. The use of those string and synth moments, they, they've they used those to build songs up nicely. Where the last album was dirtier and grittier and darker overall, this one has a little more light in it, so the top end is a bit more present the way they've written the songs like the hooks and things like hey lord there's always that there's a bit more of an upbeat feel to it so you've got that like you were saying there's a bit more of that humor the light side of this band is coming back into play a little bit on this overall though it's still riff driven with heaps of melody this one has more use of the gang and the backing vocals which was very cool some new effects have been found as they've moved through the years in the studio like you were saying the vocal effect i thought they were used just enough to spice things up on the record to not make it sound generic like everything else they've just done just enough sort of make it sort of you're going to still get something different from this band every single time you listen to them, which is not a bad thing at all. I actually enjoy that. Uh, nice tempo and gear changes on this. The album flows pretty nicely as a complete piece. There's some solid hooks in this, like covered off, like the singles I was going for, they were, they were going for radio singles on those. And so the hooks are definitely present for that. But I liked how they used both the upper and the lower register in the vocal on this album too. So you've, you're getting more of Andy Duris's vocal ability coming through on this one, which is where you're saying you can see this line can definitely play. And maybe I don't know what they're doing these days, but hopefully they have started to take on the the big epics from, you know, the keeper albums one and two. And cause I reckon this lineup can pull it off or not that this lineup exists today, but you know what I mean? Um, puts me in mind a little bit of revenge from kiss with its tone overall, not a direct comparison, but there's just something about it, that, that dirt, that dirtier edge on this one. Like you think of some of the songs on the Revenge album and tonally they sort of cross over for mine with this. It's another grow over an album. It might not hook you at the beginning, but it does um, grow on you over time. Like a lot of their records. So this is what I was saying earlier on. Make sure you give all their listens, all their albums a few listens before you make up your mind of where it sits with you. Um, if anything, this album seems a little more frantic in overall playing than some of the previous records. I've gotten the, the pace coming back into it a bit now. Uh, going for more of the old school metal edge, which worked well for them here. Uh, there are f- the flip side to that though is tracks like Time, which really do slow things down on a record like this, and they go on for some big emotive weight, and they've done that pretty well. So the maturity now is definitely coming into this band. Uh, it's an interesting album that might be a little bit overlooked, I think. Um, it's not the same as the fan favorite Heights from this band. It's, from my perspective, this is them starting to get back up to toward that direction again. Um, and the bonus tracks on this were probably the most cohesive they've been on a record so far too. The studio tracks are pretty cool, but also the live versions that you had on this were, were a good listen as well. Uh, I'm not sure how many of what we'll do here. So what have I written there? Uh, how many? I don't know, whatever. Um, <laughs> I've written some crazy silly notes there. Overall, um, I think this is one of those ones that again will grow on you over time. It did for me. It's a bit of a surprise packet, ultimately, this record. Eight and a half out of 10 from me. Uh, Revelation, Midnight Sun, and Hey Lord, believe it or not, because that hook, even now you hear the, the title and you can hear the hook, and that's yeah. a mark of a good song for mine. So very, very cool. But we've covered some covers from this band, and now we're definitely going to get into the cover territory from this band by going to Metal Juke next holding up all right you don't need a break you're content to keep going let's do it all right cool so halloween with metal jukebox 11 tracks for 51 minutes this is a cover album from the band uh, released november 1999 via castle communications produced by the band uh, not only is this different because it's all covers but also the band members recorded their parts separately in other countries to each other as well mm-hmm. and the whole product was put together at andy deris's uh tenerife studio in spain so there mm-hmm. we go over to you okay um Definitely one for the Halloween collectors who enthusiasts. It's I got the feeling this might have been done to complete a record contract, maybe, because it's just a really odd shift to go from better than raw with what they do next. And just well, I did go to a different label album. after this, so maybe you're right. Yeah, because it just seems a very odd choice to do at this point in their career. Mm. Um, 
the track selections are really interesting because it's very it shows how diverse the band's interests are. You've got yeah. songs from Jeff Rot- you got one song from a metal band, Scorpions, and you got Jeff Rotol, ABBA, David Bowie, Faith No More, The Beatles, Focus, a- Alex Harvey, Frank Marino, Cream, and Babe Ruth. And yeah, it's just very unusual. But they, yeah. they pull off some pretty cool stuff. There are some covers that have surpassed um, the originals, but there's nothing on here that will. But okay. doesn't say they're not badly done. There's some yep. they're, they're competent, they're made in their own, but I'd still go to the originals with most of these. Yep. Um, with a good cover, though, it probably inspires people to go back and hear the original. And yep. uh, probably the most overlooked artist on here would be Frank Marino, his band Mahogany Rush. If you haven't heard yep. them, well worth your time checking them out. A um, little bit like a white version of Jimi Hendrix. Okay, cool. In fact, his story was that he took too much acid one time, ended up in hospital, and got possessed by Jimi Hendrix. So, <laughs> if one <Okay>. just... <laughs> yeah, okay. but the guy can definitely play, so it's worth checking out. Cool. Um, Hocus Pocus, their song, well, from the band Focus. If mm-hmm. you ever wondered what yodeling and heavy metal sounds like together, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, that is my standout <laughs> on the album, though, because I never thought that Godwing and heavy metal could work, and it does. Overall, okay. I give it five covers out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Um, well, so far we've had some pretty cool covers from this band, so it's not a huge shock to see them go to a covers album. You think about other bands that have done it all before as well. It's not out of the ordinary for bands to go and do these ones, so it is what it is. Now, first off, it's overall pretty aggressive in tone, aside from where that simply won't work. Um, where it you know, like so they've picked and they've overall done more aggressive arrangements, um, more metal based arrangements, I guess, and picked out the songs they know where it won't work. So, for, for example, the Bowie song, they know they're not going to be able to pull it off there. So, they didn't, they kept pretty faithful to the original on that one. Um, you've got like pretty faithful renditions of things, like I was saying before, like, uh, what he's a woman, she's a man would be pretty close. Um, from out of nowhere is very, very close, things like that. But then you got some ones that are just uh, like between ABBA and David Bowie, you get two extremes. Like ABBA was definitely much more aggressive than the original. Mm-hmm. David Bowie was pretty much a carbon copy of the original. So mm-hmm. they've gone very weird and wild on the spectrum they've gone for there. It does work as an overall listener, which is pretty cool. Nice and gritty in production, you know, for the way this was done in 1999, that's pretty well fucking you know they've done a pretty good job with this uh, you could pro- probably do with a little more balance overall but it's because it's pretty mid focused but the tone of the album it, it worked well for what they're doing here it's, it's meant to feel sort of like you know the band playing in the garage on some cover songs and it does that but it's more polished than that sounds too by the way that it's actually pretty well mixed for the for the most part the arrangements work pretty well but there were, were some misses for mine like the buddy holly track that didn't come off it, it, that arrangement didn't work um, performances are solid you should expect no less by this point the band have, have clicked they've got it there the only problem is that some of the arrangements don't hit the mark and the production might not quite be the taste but these things are also taste driven versus you know execution driven so to speak um it's a fun listen that plays out pretty well uh, the album dynamics are, are good doesn't drag um you know it it continues their appetite uh, for long songs with this. Again, they they just seem to find a way that you're never going to get like a 30 to 40 minute album from these guys. It's just not going to happen. And not even on this one do they do that. I don't think it's essential listening um, for this band. Um, but I think that... I think that some of the covers they've had, like the Cold Sweat and the Electric Eye, those covers were better than what a lot of the ones are on this record. But at the same time, though, I think that they're pretty good uh, in general. It's worth a listen. The first pass might be fun, but it probably won't be going. You won't won't be one you'll be reaching off the shelf for much more often than that kind of thing. You'll hear it the first time you go, that was pretty cool. The second and third time through, you're going to be like, "Um, whatever. Not not a bad thing. It's just there's nothing really to drag you back to the record even though it is overall done pretty well it's going to depend what you think of their song choices ultimately at the end of the day and how they've done it it's, it's just going to be a taste thing for me it was seven out of ten pretty good um from out of nowhere he's woman she's a man and locomotive breath were mine but then again you know your standouts are generally going to be pretty you know predetermined by what you like in general anyway so you're not going to deviate too far from your tastes um but yeah that was that one so now we go back to uh 
the originals from this band. We're going to move on to The Dark Ride. And this is 12 tracks for 52 minutes. The ninth album from the band released October 2000 by Nuclear Blast. So a new label now. Produced by Roy Zed and Charlie Bauerfeind. Uh, so new producers at Misueno Studio in Spain. Uh, this one marks a bit of a change in direction with this album being somewhat constructed in the feedback you see reading up on it. This was the last of the Master of the Rings era lineup with both Roland Grapoff and Uli Kush leaving the band after the tour of this album and they would go on to form Master Plan down the line over to you when this came out there were advertisements for it in just about every big rock and metal magazine mm. but i couldn't find a damn copy of it anywhere it actually took a few years for me to hear it okay and on the compilation album uh, treasure chest there's a few tracks on there mm-hmm. and that was the first time i heard some of them and some of them instantly became favorite tracks cool and i finally got to hear it and i absolutely love this album this is perfect this is Funny how every- overlooked this is, isn't it? This is, yeah. this is not highly regarded, but I, I'm like, I, I enjoyed this one. Go on, this yeah. Is fantastic album. Mm. Um, it's every type of Halloween. It's fun, it's menacing, darkness, reflection, horror, gothic, romantic, atmospheric, and the track flow is perfect. Mm. The, the guitars for the first time are heavily downtuned. Uh, there was a bit of an outside influence to them for the more modern sound, sound, and some of the people in the band fought against it, but I thought they did a fantastic job. Mm. Yeah. Um, they still have the heavy and fast up, but there's a lot more heavy palm muting, which has really influenced the sound throughout this album. And but damn, yep. they still have a damn sense, a damn good sense of melody. Mm. And the opening track, Mister Torture, gang vocals, killer riff, musical midsection is off the charts. The solo is cool, drumming yep. lyric, and it's a lot of fun live. You just have the good audience song. that know every single lyric in the song. And oh, you cool! Come up with, that's, a, yeah. that's that's okay. Cool. Yeah, everyone just goes off with that song is played. Everyone just repeats or sings along. It's a lot of fun. Nice. You can't listen to that song and not smile. And it's that oh. knowing evil grin. Yeah. Andy's vocals sit really well within the between the two guitars. And yep. where he's taken it from the perspective of the villain or the victim, he manages to use different styles when he's yeah. delivering lyrics and telling his stories. Um it's a bit of an Alice Cooper influence there. I think. Yeah, I was. I th- yeah, um, yeah, cool. You got that as well. Yeah, but I think it's really starts to develop that style of his singing from this moment on going mm-hmm. forward. Um, if I could nice fly, touch. It's a nice it? touch. It's a nice yeah. touch. In that. Yeah, it fits really well with what they're mm-hmm. doing. The song "If I Could Fly" there's a beautiful melody, heavy riff, great vocals, performances, and that's the song I want played at my funeral. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, I absolutely adore that song. It's one of my favorite all-time songs. Nice. Uh, the backup vocals, the piano melody, it's a great guitar solo, and I got to hear it live when they played in Melbourne, and that was a highlight. Nice. Yeah, it's just like, yes, awesome. <laughs> Bucket list moment for you? Fucking yeah. Yeah. The song, The Departed, which should probably be called The Sun Is Going Down because it's one of the main lyrics sung in it. Yep. I'm, Halloween have always been a band that can paint a picture with their music and their lyrics, and yep. this one... It's just one of those ones that set the scene in my mind for mm. the Halloween night yep. or the first of a horror movie. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Song. Yeah. It has this amazing knack for creating atmosphere and yeah. vibe. Uh, great song structures, creating moves, moods. Um, the track Immortal and I Live for Your Pain. They just mm-hmm. had this great m- mood for yeah. the book. I've never heard anyone who heard this album say they don't like it. And it disappoints me when I hear people say I've got no time for Halloween after Kiski left because you are missing out on some Yeah, great. this album is one that people should check out, I reckon. Yeah, it's fucking amazing. Uh, ten dark rides out of ten. <laughs> then that, uh, Mr. Torture, Mirror, Mirror, If I Could Fly, The Departed, I Live For Your Pain, and Immortal. But everything's amazing. Yeah. I'm with you. I, it's funny because you read up on things. I, I read up on the albums before I get into it, especially not knowing what I'm getting into with a lot of these records. You would think this wasn't a good album. Like a lot of people have abandoned the band by this point in time. There was a bit of backlash on this one, apparently. Like it just, I don't know, band members didn't like it overly from the way it was put together. Like there's a, you know, the bar was set pretty low reading up on it. And then you put it on. Yeah. Like fucking what's wrong with you people? Um, It starts off with the now obligatory instrumental and then goes into something we've never heard before in terms of darkness from this band. This is the darkest release we've had yet. Um, For me... It throws back a little bit on the melody and the hooks. It's a bit of a meeting of the eras, like at the start of this. You got the the melody and the hooks, but this is much more a heavy, pure, darker metal sort of a sound overall to it as well. 
Uh, there are certainly some of the darkest moments we've ever had so far from this band. I think the use of the down tune guitars was nice on this. The vocals going into the lower register worked pretty well for Andy Darius. Like that's actually a really good spot for him yeah. to sing in. Um, not that his other vocals are bad, but that was just, that was a really good addition to the repertoire. And you find more of that as the years go on too. The synth work on this was not upbeat like you've had in the past. This is more of the horror score kind of effect going on where it's, you know, parts coming in and out to add dramatic effect. Uh, the lyrics also cross over to much less happy territory. Like you were talking about the victim or the, the one, the, the other term you used. Villain. Sorry. The villain, the villain. Yeah. That's the one. Um, you've got that element here and that's pretty much what this is built around. Um, this is a darker beast of a record. And I like the direction they've taken with this. I like how they slowed things down too. You get some pretty, you know, tasty, faster stuff, but when they've got this one chugging along, it kicks pretty fucking hard. Like this is a genuine heavy metal record. Mm. Uh, it's another strength of their bow, which is really well executed. I think the album flow is great. This one goes through some really good dynamics on it and some nice little bits of theater were added in as well. So you're getting that, the past of the band clashing with this new era in the, the new metal sound coming through in the two thousands and they just nailed it. Uh, it's a chunkier album overall. It's got a little bit of a snap to the grid kind of effect, but it's, it's still organic. It's not over, over like all, not like a lot of bands where it's just all, you know, cut to it. This has just got that, that effect that was coming in, but it's still very organic playing. Um, I think the writing was, was well done. I enjoyed the tones on this too. The tones were different. The guitar tones are different. Also stuff being down tuned that, but I liked where it all balanced out. Um, for all the darkness on this, you do get the light from the previous releases, just peeking through like, you know, sun through the clouds here and there. Um, it feels like a really natural progression for this band, even going through this process while this is a little bit of an outlier, this doesn't feel forced or contrived. This feels like a natural thing for this band to do. Um, if you haven't checked out this band, this album, I reckon you really should. And for, for all the bands that have struggled traditionally in this era of music, like you look at Ozzy, you look at Dio, you look at all these other icons that, that struggle to make music during this time. This is probably the best example I've come across of a band actually taking the time around them and running it through their filter to mm -hmm. create an album that's a little bit different. This is fucking well done. Not many bands have pulled off an album like this that were from the old school and going into the 2000s era and not many have done an album like this. This is probably the best I've seen coming through that process like i said don't overlook this album check it out for sure this is a damn fine record from one of the band from a band when most bands that started out in the 80s really struggled at this time this one is fucking right up there um great songs great performances this is worth the time there are no dud tracks nine out of ten from me mirror mirror escalation 666 and mr torture are my standouts on this nice so there we go. i was wondering how that one would go um yeah. so i'm glad that that went as well, I'd be curious to get other people. Um, yeah, I'd love to get about, about this. That should be a yeah. central list. But also, I think, yeah, I want to get audience feedback on this one too. I want to get audience feedback yeah. uh, on this one. I'm just going to quickly shoot Timmy a message saying, doing, oh, fucking hell, one. And then we'll call you back in. Just let you know while we do production on the fly here at the show. Uh, <laughs> But now we've gone from that darker side of things to an album that has a very odd title in Rabbit, Don't Come Easy. Although the story behind the, the album title is pretty cool. Um, 13 tracks for 65 minutes, the 10th album from the band, released May 2003 by Nuclear Blast, produced by Charlie Bauer, find at Misuena Studios in Spain. This is the band's first with Sasha Gerstner on guitar and no official drummer on this one, although Mark Cross managed to do two tracks. Stefan Schwarzman did two, including a bonus track, and Mickey D did the balance. And I think you can tell when Mickey D is playing. Yeah. Uh, over to you. I um, don't know if you noticed yet, but they tend to go light album, dark album, light mm. album, dark album. They swing back theme, and forth. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually haven't heard this album until about a month ago. Okay. And, yeah. Someone was selling some CDs on Facebook, so I ordered it and it arrived in time. But I've been listening to it on Spotify and a few passes. And it was when I got on CD and started listening to it for there, that it was really growing on me. Okay. Um, it came and went really quickly, I remember, because um, – following Halloween at the time and you get a couple of advertisements and then it didn't really have major distribution and mm. people just kind of forgotten about it. Well, this uh, one ends up being a, a, a bargain bin double album with the yeah, dark ride, <laughs> which makes no fucking sense to me. But yeah. Okay. Go on. But um, 
after a few listens, it's very underrated and very underappreciated. There's mm. a line in the first song that's called Just a Little Time where he mentions there's something growing in his pants. And mm. that's exactly what his album does. It grows on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, they got the humour back for sure on this one. It's heavy riffs, lighter in tone than the dark ride, and the new guitarist, Sasha Gertner, is an absolute gun. He yeah. can certainly play. Um, he'll grow on to breathe some much-needed new life into coming albums. Probably what um, was required after Kai. Not yeah. Kai. Yeah, Kai. Yep. Yeah, they definitely need a real uh, a virtuoso. A shredding lead, yeah. yeah. Definitely. And I like how, once again, they've brought him in as a songwriter. He contributes mm. to some of the writing on this, so... You're in Halloween band, you're part of the family, not just yeah, a hired gun. That's good. Hell was made in heaven. That has a really killer guitar riff. It just keeps coming. They keep coming back to that, and it's just instantly catchy. And I noticed that when it comes back after the instrumental midsection, it's accompanied by an off drum beat pattern, and yep. Mickey D plays on that. And yep. it's kind of funny that Mickey D from Motorhead brought the prog element to the power metal band of Halloween. Mm. Fuck, that works really well. Yeah. Like, hang on. That beat doesn't quite sit there, but it works really well. Yeah. You go back and listen to it, I'm like, fuck, that is really cool. But apparently the band were pushing Mickey D to go back to what he'd done early, early days. Yeah. So he went back to his roots kind of thing to, to yeah. bring his stuff to this. Because he had the speed, he had the power, he just had to yeah. get some more technical ability. Mm. Um, like I said, with repeated listens, this album really does um, grow on you and grabs your attention. I gave it to eight rabbits out of ten. <laughs> Found a liar, some for the world, back against the wall, nothing to say. Hell was made in heaven. Great album. Cool. Well, it's funny how we've gone from also the the they do a dark album, then they do a light album. But on this one, it seems to be almost a thing where they'll it's almost it's not quite the same rhythm, but it's almost like they'll do a, an opening instrumental, then not do one, then do one, then not do one. This one doesn't have that one. But the opener is much more in line with what the band were doing before the dark ride. Um, there are some little differences. So, so, you know, just a little sign is much more, I guess, typical Halloween than what you got on the dark ride. Yeah. Um, still some little differences in it though. It's not all just, you know, not just going back to what they did before. They, they still always continue to evolve and grow. Um, I think the new guitarist has a bit to do with that as well. Uh, there's a bit more space in the writing that with this too. Uh, more, ability like they were, they were playing with the lead a bit and that a bit more but they're also you know not afraid of space as much as they were in the past too i think uh this is a bit more light in the sound than the previous album obviously uh it, for whatever reason they've just grown like 2000 it's funny from 2000 and 2003 there's a big difference in general sound across mm. the musical scene and and this one ties in with that which is actually not a bad thing for this band having a light back into it um a bit more drama in the composition overall too which is cool uh there's a bit of a i'm noticing a bit more of the king diamond effect on this one like i did in the first album there's a bit more of that coming into this one too and i reckon the composition on this record shows that a bit more than we've seen for a little while it's not as dark and menacing but it's something in the way they use the space and the production the writing the performance to really bring the drama in that progressive way as well so you got the progressive elements that you were talking about but also the the space and the drama was used really nicely on top of this one this this has a bit of cheese that that you know wink and nudge effect coming into the band again um it's an odd thing where they're really melting everything they've done including the last album into this one album so they keep finding new things and distilling them down into their sound as they go along no two albums are completely alike they have a recurring theme for the most part but they're never completely alike um some really it's got some nice throwback elements in this too it adds to the nostalgia which you know this band has more than enough right to claim the nostalgia effect being probably close to 20 years into their career at this point in time so some really good throwback moments and something we haven't had heaps of for a while that is on this is that dual lead guitar work it's a welcome return um i love the little guitar battles i think this is probably the most lead guitar battle kind of panning left and right all that sort of stuff that this is probably the most noticeable in that regard maybe on the first album but this is the one where i really stopped went oh hang on definitely got the guitar battle going on on this one it's very very cool to have that um not over the top it all plays to the songs but it's just a great display of, of the talent and i love the pounding double kick drums going underneath of those solo moments as well very very cool um like i was saying before it's odd to me that this and the dark rider bundled together as a two for one pack which devalues both of these albums incredibly uh they're both really strong works um the production was well balanced nice subtle layering of synth sounds really nice on this too i like the rumble at the bottom end but also how warm this was overall uh bright top end really complemented all of that 
and the panning of things like the guitar work I mentioned before was very, very well done. Album flow is cool. Nice peaks and troughs. Um, the ballad right in the middle of this record, as opposed to the end in the past was a nice touch on this one too. Um, the, I liked the mix of the more, more old school stuff alongside tracks that would fit on the dark ride as well. So you still get some of the dark ride on this one, but they've blended it in with you know the previous stuff they used to do as well. Lyrics are also well done here. Uh, it's more diverse, but also really good storytelling on this. Uh, it's a much lighter album than the last one overall, but I don't know. Just so far for me, what I'm coming across is where I don't know how many albums we're close to 10 albums or so into this one now got to admire their consistency like they're just a really consistent band apart from a couple of outliers they're really good overall basically if you like metal with melody and you haven't heard this album then get onto it um you shouldn't gloss over this album or a large part of their career i can understand a couple of the albums but so far i don't know what you're missing like you don't know what you're missing if you're not checking out these ones if you've just gone onto the kiss gear and not bothered beyond that fuck you're missing out um this is another really solid record eight out of ten from me uh back against the wall never be a star and don't stop being crazy with my standouts on this release very very cool so now we're gonna bring tim back in hopefully it all goes smoothly here we go hey he's back hey how you doing did you enjoy your little time with the headphones while doing the the game show (laughs) yeah in the green room Mm. Well, we're here. We're back. We've got. We're going to take a little intermission after we do this uh, record here today. But we're going to go with Keeper of the Seven Keys, The Legacy. Uh, it's just thirteen tracks for seventy-seven minutes. The eleventh album from the German band, released October two thousand and five by Steamhammer. So another new label, uh, produced by Charlie Bauerfeind across studios in Spain, Germany, and the United States. This is the band's first with Danny Lobel on drums and is a continuation of the keeper of the seven keys albums from 1987 and 1988. So we're talking about shit more than, no, no, I don't know, 15 odd years between a bit over 15 years between releases, so getting between 15 and 20 years. All right, let's go to you first on this one, Dave. Okay. Uh, if you're expecting a complete rehash of what they did on keeper of the seven keys part one and two, then that's not what you're going to get here. This is more inspired by that and writing towards a similar theme. Um, much like the original keeper albums, you do get the catchy accessible fun song and then you get the more challenging epic songs, but then that's quite normal for Halloween album. Um, I like how they don't try to do exactly the same thing with their um, epic tracks. I mean, the ones that you got on the original Keeper albums and the two that you get on here, they're all very different. Uh, mm. Occasion Occasion Avenue, when I first heard that, it became an instant favourite. Um, great composition, epic oh, and dramatic in structure. The evil chanting is always fun. I love that mm. shit. And, and he's having fun with his vocal delivery. There's a lot of more experimentation. Uh, for the first time on a Halloween album, we have a guest vocalist yeah. on the song of the Universe, Cadence Night. Um, if you're into the medieval stuff and you haven't checked out Blackmore's Night, Who's yep. Richie Blackmore is married to Cadence Knight. There's some pretty cool stuff on there. And whenever she appears on a metal album, it's outstanding. Um, good yeah, singer. good video clip to that song too. Mm. But personally, I think the best thing that happened to Halloween at this point in their career was the new guitarist and the new drummer. They mm. have breathed a hell of a lot of new life into this band. And um, the coolest thing that happened was the tour. It went along <laughs> with the album. The tour, like, Keeper of the Seven Keys and Halloween return to the set list. Ah, nice. The new drummer and the new guitarist have a hell of a lot to do with that. Possibly, and yeah. the older members um, have risen to the challenge because mm. of playing with the charts from about this moment. Yep. Uh, but this album does seem to divide fans, I think, because it's Chuck the Keeper album um, theme on it. The older fans may have jumped back in after all this time and it wasn't exactly what they were hoping, hoping for. But, yeah, I don't know why because it's a pretty damn good album. Hmm. But because there are some really outstanding songs, there are also a little few songs that are a bit of filler. But I think yeah. that comes down to taste as to what you like and what you expect this band to be. Yeah. Um, the other thing I question about this album is I don't know why it needs to be on two discs. It's um, both discs are around the 38-minute mark, which is quite easily fit onto a single disc. Mm. But um, I think they only did that to match the theme of, what they wanted to do with the first. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it was necessary. Though. I think, but at least they didn't flesh it out to fill, fill up two, two CDs. Mm. I think they kind of wanted to do the Keeper album and then they kind of got 
stuck into that where it would have breathed more if it didn't have that keeping the theme on it. It probably would have been a better idea. Yeah. But new lineup and re- re- revisiting their old um, the past and bringing some old songs back into the set list. It's a great idea. Yep. Overall, I gave it eight out of ten. Eight keys out of ten. <laughs> um, so that were Occasion Avenue, Light the Universe, Kings for a Thousand Years, Mrs. God, Invisible Man, Shade in the Shadow, My Life for One More Day. So yeah, it's a good album. All right. So, Tim, we left you not long after the original two Keeper albums. You had one album after that with Pink Bubbles Go Ape. And so now we've mm-hmm. thrown you into where this one is. So where would you land with this one? So what, what what I would like to know is, was the decision to uh, go back to the Seven Keys thing, was that made before or after this album was written? I'm not too sure. Before. 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 Okay, cool. Yeah, no, just just curious because, uh, uh, um, as you said, it's not um, – they're not rehashing the original Seven Keys albums, but they are writing to a similar genre, Yeah, you know, like a similar style. There's a similar uh, a pacing and a cadence to it that uh, that, that just sits in that, uh, that style. And, again, you know, you, 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 there's the, the typical stuff, you know, the – Again, they're leaning into that that vocal a little bit, and uh, you know, again, there's that that subtle key undertone that's just very nice and shimmery yep. uh, that comes comes through when it needs to. Um, for mine, I think you know, musically, I think there's a lot of great chops on here. I think this mm-hmm. is um, you know, again, uh, the new drummer coming out. Actually, that was the one that I noticed. Uh, uh, more a uh, more of a uh, a modern metal drummer mm. and uh, a, a, a traditional metal drummer, and that it sort of sits uh, ties the whole thing together a little bit more. They had Mickey D on the last album, Tim, and I reckon having Mickey D on the last album influenced them a bit. Yeah, well. yeah. Well, Mickey Mickey's great too. So mm. yeah, that that that's not a surprise. Um, and you can just hear as well, especially with a lot of the um the tighter, more complex rhythm parts. Mm. Again, just having that solid double bass in there just really ties the whole thing together. Yep. Nicely makes it much for much more a tighter modern metal album. Yeah. Uh, I I was surprised listening to this first time though, I actually didn't realise it was a double album. Mm. I just thought it was like a very long uh well, in terms of their their album lengths, making this a double album when most of their albums are around this length is a bit of a surprise. Well, that's yeah. the thing. Like, it's it, it you know, like it it was like fifteen minutes longer than the average Halloween album. Mm. Which I mean, like for mine, like I got a little bit bored listening to it towards the end, to be honest. Okay. Um, yeah. but um, for mine, I think it just would have been better off being around the one hour mark, which is about where everything else is yeah and just shaving a little bit down and it would have been much better mm. uh but uh apart from that you know it's pretty good uh where are we born, born born on judgment day is my highlight okay cool and yeah seven and a half out of ten all right nice well for me going through all the process up until this point it feels like like you've gone with, it's funny how Dave mentioned that this one seems to have divided the fans a bit because I took it in the context of, because the opening track is, you know, the King for a thousand years. And so for me, that immediately set the tone of this being set basically a thousand years after where Keeper part one and two were. So this is about the millennia that's gone between. And so things are going to be inspired by or harken back to, but not be a direct follow, so to speak. Now, I don't know if anyone's read the Dune series. This is where they make the, you know a huge leap after sort of like Dune Messiah, I think it is, and they go like years and years and years into the future with the next book kind of thing. So there's a huge leap in time uh, that's happened here. And I think they've actually, it's a good idea to go down that path as opposed to just continue where they had the other two albums, especially with a new lineup. So many years have gone on between. You're not going to recapture the original feel, so it's better to do something inspired by as opposed to directly complementary to kind of thing. This has got to be something that's set like the years that have passed between the, 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 the settings make sense to me. Um, uh, I thought the opening track set it up well and it played it out. Like they're, they're telling it's a legacy. Like they, they, the title of the album is the legacy. And this feels like they're telling the legacy of what's going on before kind of thing. Uh, I thought it was, yes, it's a double album, so to speak. I thought it was a, a, 
a cool trick to open sort of the sides of things with um, epic tracks at the, you know, on both sides. That was very, very cool. It helped to set the tone along with some excellent lyrics on this. And just when you think that the band might fall into a formula um, once and for all, this band brings again something that surprises you. They continually evolve. This one has some pretty grand compositions. Nothing overly progressive, but it's much more expansive than we've had in the past from these guys. You still got the riff, the heaviness, all that sort of stuff, the tempo. It's a bit different overall. When they open things up into the slower, spacious moments, it's again like they've gone back to Pink Floyd, but in an even bigger way than that before kind of thing. Uh, but for all that, like we're talking about the riffs, the double kick, all that, that goes the opposite direction again too. So you're getting into the metal side of things more directly on this as well. It's a very interesting album to listen to. Lots of different tones, lots of different instruments and effects uh, go along with the style shift on this. It all works together with the composition, the production, and everything they've done up until now, like they've had the concept album in the past and stuff, but this one actually feels the most like an actual concept record for mine. This has a flow and a feel. It feels like a narrative is going on. There's a story being told. Um, this one is the most like that for mine in, the, in their work up to this point. And it also feels a bit like their most ambitious record in a lot of respects. It's got some some pretty bold strokes taken here to create a volume that's, you know, completes that arc, that trilogy kind of thing. I reckon they've gone about it the right way with the passage tumble. Also having some great callback moments. It's really well held, tied the whole thing together in, in the three you know, chapters of the story. The production is also probably the most dynamic we've seen yet uh, from them. Some really good use of hard panning emphasis on different tones at different times. It's really been all used well to add to the whole listening experience and to make the overall product a stronger listen too that it is well balanced ties into that um there's just a lot more tricks in the depth of it all and the space and layering alongside of that hard panning it's refreshing to get a genuine ear candy kind of a record you can listen to this on repeat spins and you'll find different things that'll get your attention as you go through it uh the guest spot from Candace Knight was a nice touch on this it ties into this being a grand effort again overall it's the first time you're getting a guest vocal from the band so you know all these things are tying into making this a bigger project thought the album flowed well um like all that stuff it's lengthy but this time it felt like it was an engaging listen i know that tim got a bit bored but for me it didn't drag i really enjoyed it it's nice to have some more of the intense stuff on the back end of it all so that is what keeps you engaged as it you know it gets a bit tiring toward the end but you get the uh, more energy into it and it makes it less fatiguing so to speak thought all in all it's pretty well put together it's not a directly hard concept album with a strict narrative being told but it ties in really nicely with the previous records and i think it does put it it completes the narrative that they're going for with those pieces so i don't think they need to go back to it again anymore i think that 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 book is closed kind of thing but this is a nice way to do something that's you know strengthens or shows off the strengths of this lineup really nicely like with the drummer coming in and, and the guitarist and that and they've got some really good chops on display with this one but it's also a good way to close it and, and say goodbye to that chapter of their time as well i think that you know for this may or may not be divisive uh, as dave was saying but i think people should check this one out i think it's a really good listen yeah. i think this is a bit of everything you know from the band plus some new tricks added again i really really enjoyed this one it wasn't hard for me to take in at all nine out of ten from me um occasion avenue as soon as i heard that one that was a fucking amazing yeah. song um do you know what you're fighting for was another one for me as well. And the King for a thousand years. So again, tying into my theme, we've um, taken on some epic tracks for me being my standouts, which I was honestly not expecting to be the case coming into it. But from there, we're going to take a brief intermission as far as the, uh, the audience is concerned. We'll come back in a few days and we'll continue on. But for now, uh, we'll take a, a quick break. We'll be back very, very soon. <laughs> We're here. We're doing our little intermission. Uh, while we're doing the intermission, we do have something for you to enjoy, though. So, Dave, I'll get you to introduce exactly what this is. Sure. Um, about five years ago, I got to do a radio a phone interview with Marcus Grosspot, the uh, bass player from Halloween, which we're doing this tribute special to. Uh, I was on the promo tour for My God Given Right. So it was good to get a chance to chat to this guy that I've been listening to since I was 10 years old. Um Interviews from five years ago, I may sound like I'm actually 10 years old because the recording makes me sound like I'm a little kid, but I swear it was only five years ago. So I'll shut up, and this is the interview with Marcus Crosswell. First up, mate, congratulations on the upcoming 15th Halloween studio album, My God Given Right. Okay, thank you. It's like uh, the 15th, right? I, I, always, I, I almost fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it up to the obsessive don't fans to remember. You don't think that how many is it is but then after it's done you think my god 
Yeah. There's a lot of music going on. So a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of music over the years, right? Um, when it was all finished, yeah. was it everything that you hoped it would be? Yeah, it's nice. We got that couple of tracks and we, we hang around individual uh, writing songs. That's how we start, you know, and then you never know what's coming up from, from the other people for, because we're like four songwriters and it's always interesting to hear what comes out of it, you know. I mean, we know we write songs for Halloween and it gets easier with the years to, to trim the track. So it sounds like an Halloween track, you know, but... We were kind of surprised, and we we had we heard that track, my God, given right, thinking it's a killer album name, you know, and it 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 came out like very very early that it's going to be the title track. Was there a, a story behind the title? It's my God, given right that you can actually do say whatever you like to do as long you, as long as you're not hurting anybody else or your neighbor or whatever whatsoever we can go out doing music you've got the god given right to do that if you like to live with the consequences because if you start it's not going to be easy but still you if you like you can go out there trying it you know trying try to make it you know that's what we thought is cool it's a cool theme but it doesn't go for only music whatever you would like to do you have to start you have to carry on it's your right to go as far as you like that's cool it's a very cool concept um are there any tracks on the album that you're particularly proud of sorry are there any uh, any songs on the album that you're really proud of i'm proud of the whole fucking <laughs> uh, shebang you know it's like when you start an album uh it's it's like it's like wow when you sit on the on the finished paper trying to get a song together you think oh I got a lot to do there's nothing yet but in a couple of months people expect you to do a killer record and then you you hold it in your hand of course you're proud of the whole co- concept with the uh, with the with the yard work and with the whole shipping you know it's not only particular songs that comes out a couple of months later listening to it and then one or the other song will stick out but as as far as i know now right after it's been finished it's it's got a it, it, it's like the whole package you know but after a couple of weeks listening to it there will be one or, or the other song sticking out a little more actually that's the way it goes with me is that how you go about picking what songs you'd play live? Um, maybe, but, but also we think that could be an easy song to play for, for people to follow. And and we have the idea to, to involve the audience sometimes. This is a great part to, to go for them or whatsoever. And if we play them and if we listen to them, that's actually, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's right. You, you think this is going to be cool. It's never going to get out of my head. So it might be nice for the audience as well and squeezing it in a live set, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you guys first started making music together back in the early 80s, did you ever think you'd be doing it 30 years later? I don't know. We were actually trying to do some music that will be lasting for a very, very, for a very long time, you know. We, we, we're not, like, uh, uh, doing it for two or three years and then doing something different again, you know. We were trying to, to create Halloween as a band that, that is lasting longer than two or three or five years, you know. Yeah. And we were actually on the right track. That's kind of how we wrote the songs. We needed some extreme uh, sound and songs. We, we could have easily done some hard rock, rock and roll type of music that was been done by everybody, you know, yeah. just to have a couple of years fun. But we wanted to, to take it to the extreme, to have it to make it even more interesting, you know, to stick out a little, just with the idea of of surviving, you know, <laughs> yeah. longer than a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Um, the 30th anniversary of your first EP is coming up. Um, will you be doing anything to celebrate its release with a reissue or something? Uh, there, there, is, there is one thing uh, in particular that, that I want to tell you. It's kind of a surprise and a little thing what we are working on, but I... I'm not really allowed to tell you yet. <laughs> no, that's fine, sure. I like surprises, so I'll keep right. an eye out for it. Yeah. Um, what inspires you to keep making music? It's like, it's like the challenge 
challenge yourself, kind of, because after so many songs, after so many records, you think, oh, what can I do? How can I? I got parts in my songs that I that I've heard before and then you have to throw them away thinking about something new it's always a challenge to not too much repeating yourself because you, you've done a lot of stuff in that 30 years but still let it sound like halloween you know and still gonna be it's still gonna be sounding fresh and kind of new but i'm not talking about new music but i'm talking about not you know repeating yourself too much so you want to do something different, but still in, in the range of Halloween. Yeah. And that's kind of a challenge you're always working on. And it's, it's, uh, it's with four songwriters, it's, it's working very good because everybody has a different style of writing. And so it's, it's not every, everything is, is not on your own shoulders, if you know what I mean. It's just like easy to work with people. After all those years, we're having a stable lineup now for more than 10 years. And it got more and more a unit, you know? Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of metal bands are getting into symphonic metal, and Blind Guardians just, just released their album, and it's all got symphonies on it. Halloween hasn't thought about doing something like that? Well, if the others are all doing it, why should we? <laughs> yeah, <fair enough. laughs> I mean, we have a little keyboards here and there. It's like symphonic metal. It's, well, we have, like, our own style, you know? We, we have, like, also very different songs. They're also very different uh, 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 sounding from each other here and there because we're all four songwriters, as I said, which makes it interesting enough. We're not saying we're, now we're going to do a symphonic album. We just write songs. But there's no... Since the, since the Keeper 3, we never thought of doing a concept or something. If you do a concept saying we do symphonic metal or we do something like Keepers or do some very long conceptual tracks, then you work very different. But this time we think it's it's just cool, write some killer songs, write some rock songs, write some metal tracks. And, you know, without a big concept behind it, it, it sounds fresh and free for us. You know, if you, if you put yourself in that cage and saying you do a concept then you have to to follow that concept but this way we are working which is very hard to follow a concept and, and working on like uh, uh stuff like this is, is not easy it's a very very different way of working we just feel like doing some killer tracks and putting it down to the cd it's it's just like the way we feel very comfortable with at the moment just stay true to what you are and you get the great songs out of it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, how do you feel when people class Halloween as the godfathers of power metal or heavy metal, whatever you want to drum with eyes it? Yeah, it's, it's nice compliments and stuff. And people started off sounding kind of that uh, style. But uh, what, what I realized after the years, they became like finding out what they can do you know, for themselves, finding their own style, you know, that's what I found very interesting. They started off sounding a little like that, but after all those years, you cannot really tell that it's going to be uh, started off with Halloween because some of them found their very own style in a way, you know, which is important. Yeah. You know, we had our influences and we started off listening to uh, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest and all those bands, and but, you know, we kind of found our own style of making music and that's what everybody should do. Yeah. But I'm still kind of proud, you know, talking to the people when, when they are telling me I was giving them, you know, the first kick to do, to do their music. And it's nice, you know. So inspiring some people is actually what you want. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, are there any young bands that have come along in the past few years that you really like? Actually, in the last past years, there was like moustache. It's uh, I don't know if, if they're young, <laughs> but they're very ugly. <laughs> but but their music is kind of ugly, and I like that. But but it's not really new, is it? Moustache is there for a couple of years already, right? Yeah. Um, you've been around for about thirty years now. How how have people's attitudes changed to metal in in general over the years in regards to popularity and fan reaction? I don't know, that's one thing, everything actually changed, the whole media side of it, like the internet and the whole promotional kind of thing and the CD and, and all that changed a lot, you know. There's 
nothing like it was before, which is okay for me. I work with it and we, we have to work with it because we're working in that business. If it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. You can deal with it. But there's one thing, it never really changed. You go out, you play, and in that very second, it has happened on stage. And you look the people in the eye and you shake hands and you talk. That kind of emotion, you know, feeling is, has never changed, actually. And the fans are still wearing their jackets with the stickers and they're all that and hanging out and you can have a nice chat with them. Actually, it never changed. We, they come, now, nowadays they come with their children, you know, we inspired them like 30 years ago and now father and mother are coming with their children. I think it's a nice, cool thing and it's still the same. We're still sitting there talking, having a nice chat, having a nice cold beer and it's, it's nice only that they bring their children. And I have that idea when, when, we, when we have like the third generation together, then the grandfather comes, the father is there, and if, and if they bring the son, I will get the son into a Halloween show for free. Wow. <laughs> no, it must be pretty awesome to see. What's the best thing about... But that needs to be in a couple of years, right? Yeah. It can happen. It can happen, <laughs> absolutely. What's the best thing about being up on stage and performing your music to a live audience? Sorry, what? the good thing or the bad thing? The best thing, yeah. The best thing is what I just told you. It's like that emotion that, that you create within, that there's no turning back. It's just happened in that very second. And I kind of like that spontaneous reaction of the people inspiring me to do something on stage or whatever. That's very, very nice. I like that. It's it's like you can, you can also you can go there and play the big, the big man. You know, it's just like you can be that macho type of guy on stage, meeting your bass and all that. You know, it's just like a little show, without having me being a totally different. I'm not really acting, but on stage you are a little actor, but. You know, we're not too much pretending to be some somebody else, you know. Yeah. But but this very moment is very, very special, this, those two hours. It's, it's always like you're switching a button and then you're like, it. I can't, it's just like that moment, you know. Yeah. Um, when did you first discover music and what was it about bass guitar that made you want to learn how to play it? I always could tell when I was listening to music in the very early days, I always could tell the bass from the guitar and the drums and all that. Some people are able to listen to music, they don't hear the bass, they, they more feel it, right? And I could say, oh, this is very, very nice what the bass is doing there. And I was always interesting in it, interested in it. And there was like the time when this punk band I met in the holiday camp, they needed a bass player. We got friends and I said, I'll do the job. And they asked me, you can... Did you play the bass before? I said, no, but I can learn. And I learned it very quick. <laughs> Suddenly I found myself back in a, in a punk band learning a mm -hmm. couple of Ramones and, and, and Sex Pistols and XTC songs. <laughs> I kind of like that. And it was just working, you know. And it was just always touching me what, what the bass was doing in some songs, you know. Yeah. When I started off listening to ACDC, there was Squealer and Love Hungry Man when there was like the first bass lines I learned and some Kiss songs like Love Gun or something like that, learning this and all that, you know. It was very, very much fun and inspired me a lot. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to achieve as a musician? I don't know. We, we 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 did a lot. We did a lot so far. <clears throat> As a musician, I can. Well, there's some festivals I would like to headline in the next ten years. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, um, any chance we'll see you guys down in Australia sometime soon? Yeah, Australia will be. We'll, we were talking about it. We were uh, we were talking. Oh, I would like to play a festival in in in. In Australia, I guess you have a lot of festivals there, right? Yeah, we, especially over summer, we have a, something called Soundwave. A lot of bands come from overseas. All right. So, Is that a metal festival? It's a, a metal, um, yeah. hard rock. It's got a bit of everything. All right, yeah. Well, we're, we have plans to come to, to, to come to Australia, like in, well, after we did Japan, because it's like the newest 
route we can have to, to Australia is being in Japan and then going over to your place. And um, it's planned to go, to do that for a couple of shows, maybe in August or something like that, or June, July, August, no, August, August or September, I guess. Um, we were talking about this and thinking it's a good idea, I haven't been there for a long time, and just coming over for a couple of shows after Japan and then going back to Germany, you know? Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. Which will be I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you, um, this new album is a return to Nuclear Blast. What led to the return to this label? <laughs> it's like there, there was no there was no harm, there was no bad words with the last record company. We just thought that the, the contract was running out and Nuclear Blast was always like around us, asking and here and there and you know, making offers and all that, and we thought it's a cool idea to go back home where we belong. Sure. <laughs> Although there was no bad words with, with the record company me before, you know, we just agreed on, okay, that's it, and then go back to Nuclear we'll Blast, yeah. which is cool. Cool. Feeling good on that label. Okay, mate. I'll wind it up, I'll let you go. Um, Personally, thank you for so many cool albums over the years, mate. I've been listening to you for about 25 years now. And, yeah, definitely mm-hmm. definitely got some cool songs. <laughs> yeah, well, we had a lot of different stuff, which I actually like looking back in the in the history and the back catalogue. It's even nice to have a couple of albums that are very, very different from what we did before, even though they weren't that successful and people started... Uh, hating it but having all this record it's nice to have some very very different stuff yeah. in your back catalogue well, I think it's cool definitely cool alright mate all the best with his new album and the upcoming tour Sorry? all the best with the new album and the upcoming tour alright thank you we will start with the festivals soon cool in the summertime I like cool thank you for the interview alright no problem okay Bye bye, mate. See you soon. Cheers. Cheers, mate. We're back from our little um, intermission while Dave's knocking shit over. This is going really well. <laughs> what was that? We were, we were going so well last time. We were. And it's amazing that it's taken till this time to, for something to go wrong. But oh well. In case you can't tell, we are continuing on now. Uh, we're going to go with Halloween and gambling with the devil. You shouldn't be gambling with the devil, Dave. That's why your thing all fell over then. Um, <laughs> this is 14 tracks for 70 minutes for the expanded edition or 12 tracks for 58 minutes for the original. 12th studio album from the band, released October 2007 via uh, SPP Steamhammer. Produced by Charlie Bowfind again at Miss Bueno Studios in Spain. Uh, on this one, the band moved away from the concept work on the previous record and just making a traditional album. And this was pretty well received, especially with Andy Derris's vocals uh, coming in for mm. some praise on this release. Dave, uh, this album is spectacular. I love mm. it. It's in line with Time of the Oath and Better Than Raw. Um, as you would expect, heavy, fast, and melodic, and it's freed them up when they don't have to write to the concept like they did on the previous album. Mm. Um, just focus more on your basic themes that you get from a Halloween album and really good songwriting. Um, as you mentioned, vocal delivery on this album is outstanding. Andy really shines throughout. Yeah. Um, and seriously, he seems to improve with age. He just gets better and better, not just in range and ability, but the way he plays around with um, different styles. I mean, he does also, some he's, he's pushing pu- and pulling like forward and backward. With yeah. His voice in that. Yeah, he'll, he'll do like some whispering or some screams mm. and growling and then just straight out singing. Yeah. Um, some definite standouts with that is um, Fallen to Pieces and Bells of the Seven Hells, which are mm. two very different songs, and he just delivers his performance to suit the style of these songs. Both great um, songs. It's a diverse listen, as always. It's what you get from a Halloween album. Uh, when this first came out, I listened to this over and over for weeks. It was just got, got me straight away. I loved it. Cool. Um, hip, killer tone and on the guitar solos, great song structure, great different riffs. Um, nice use of light and shade in the track order. It's kind of like that musical journey Jimmy used to bang on about yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely an album like that, which is why it's so easy to do on repeat listens. Um, they create different moods on each song, like they always do. Um, yep. Nine pumpkins out of ten. Down that's where kill it. As long as I fall, pain a new world. Those are the seven hells. Fall into pieces and I am E. Nice. Well, we've crossed over a lot of the standout tracks there. Um, where the last was sort of a big and expansive kind of a listen, you know, tying into the, the Keeper of the Seven Keys and being legacy in that 
This one is much more punchy and, and straight to the point. I've got a huge Judas Priest vibe right from the start of this. That, mm-hmm. that opening is just straight out of the Judas Priest playbook. And the vocals on that go into that healthy kind of territory, which is really cool. Well done on that. And alongside those blistering riffs and the wailing vocals, uh, there, it's also got that more aggressive tone to the vocal as well, but you've still got melodic hooks. The contrast between sort of the aggressive vocal and the hook-based stuff and the high pitch, it all ties in really nicely. And I loved the hectic drumming going underneath all that as well. Uh, I love the darkness on this record. All that stuff combined, there's a lot of darkness in the tone as well. It's a pretty intense listen energy-wise. It's one of their more full-on rec- records. Like just it, there's an intensity about it. With, after the last one especially, it's a huge contrast in, in the way you've got those two albums and they come out at you. I like the uh, subtle layering of the synth through the whole thing as well. That really added again to the darker tone, nothing over the top, but it does round the sound wall out really nicely. Uh, But it's also brought forward at the right times to great, almost classical kind of an effect in just the right ways. The range in instrumentation along with sort of effects in production is really well done in that regard. There was some great lead work, some solos and he were fantastic. The, The dueling guitar is back for this one too and it ties in um with some overall really composed or really well composed pieces of music like i said the the darker or darker overall tone of this is really cool and the guitar tone in particular has a darker sort of edge to it i don't know if that was the same to you but compared compared to the last album in particular this whole thing mm. is just a much darker listen but not slow it's very energetic very very pacey to go through this one very like i said punchy I'm enjoying how Charlie is, is seems to be the right guy to mix this band. There's a reason why they did so many albums with him, but what he does, he brings the positive side of what a studio can do for a band uh, to Halloween without overdoing it. So that's, they use the tricks and do all the bits and pieces, but nothing is over the top and gets attention grabbing. It's all complimentary, which is cool. This is really well mixed, nice and punchy, just the right amount of those tricks being put into it. Still little bits of those things creeping, like, sorry, there are bits of the, the time around them creeping into their sound like they have with all of their albums up till now. But again, it's run through the filter. It fits them. They always try new things, but it always seems to fit into what they're doing, which is cool. And this one for mine flowed really nicely as well. There's a lot of like, a lot to like about this band's later catalog. So again, a lot of people that I know got off of the band when Kiski left or a lot of people in the audience polling feedback, you know, they say Pink Bubbles guy, it was the last straw for them because they couldn't continue on after that because that was when Kai Hansen left. I think there's a lot to like about the band's later catalogue. If you're one of those people that jumped off, this is one to check out as well. It's a solid album. If you like riffs and melody, you know, like most of their stuff, there's heaps from this band to enjoy. It's another fine record where they've grown just enough but still haven't lost who they are, and that's Halloween. Uh, The bonus tracks on this album are good too, which means they're sort of getting better at that aspect as we go along as well. I gave this one an eight and a half out of 10. I picked IME, the bells of the seven hells and paint a new world as well. I think there are those three. Yeah, were all, yeah. So there we go. Yeah. Definite crossovers there, which is cool. But now we move on to the next one. We've only got a few to get through in this little mini session here for this. So now we move on to seven sinners and this time and last time around we did this day predicted I would like it. So we'll see how we go with that one uh this is 16 tracks for 74 minutes on the expanded edition 13 tracks for 58 minutes on the original the 13th studio from the german band released october 2010 again by SP- spv Steamhammer and spine farm records produced by charlie bauerfeind at miss Wiener studio in spain uh this one comes about after the band's 25th anniversary unarmed album and was able to be streamed on myspace yes we're talking about myspace uh, a week before the physical release uh, noting that this on this song, each track was written by an individual member as opposed to being a collaborative effort, which is a, I think they did the same thing on the last album as well. I don't know, but there's a, this one, they made a point of it. Yeah. Not sure which one, no. Yeah. Anyway, you're the expert, but over to you. Yeah. Um, the Dark Ride was their darkest album, and mm. this is by far their heaviest. Um, some albums can be, uh, there are full on, Onslaught can be a bit repetitive, but they've really made each track diverse enough to maintain interest for quite a long listen. This is a very mm. long album. Yeah. Um, this one focuses more on darker and more violent sides of horror. I think as much as they're influenced by bands around at the time, I mean, there's probably a kill switch engage. Um, yeah. They still made it themselves, but mm. there's kind of a heavier metal side. 
I got a bit of Ramstein. Yeah. yeah, you got that as well. But you also got the really violent horror movies around, like Saw and Hostel. And I think this is taking a page out of that. This is going for the bloodshed mm. Halloween. Um, the dynamics of the band have really changed with this release. It's more the newer members that have composed the material. Yeah. The um, new guitarist has contributed three songs, and there's six from Andy. I mean, the original members only have like two, one or two songs each. Mm. So it's more the newer guys that are bringing the new blood, new, new vibe. Works um, well, are you metal? Yeah. Are you metal? Some people say that song's cheesy, but who the hell cares? I reckon that's an awesome song. It's, it's Halloween. Fun. There's always been a bit of cheese about them. I don't know why that would be a complaint with this band. That's part of their shtick. Mm. The cheese album, it's fun. And it, mm. it is amazing live when you've got the whole audience getting into this song. Okay. So, that would be cool to see. Yeah. It's definitely a fan, a live song. Yeah. Um, well, this is about as brutal as Halloween do, does get. There's a flute solo. Yeah. <laughs> I got the Jethro Tull going. Yeah, it works perfectly inside this. It, it just goes really well to harmonize guitars. And it's an, there's a nice change in pace with the song The Smile of the Sun. And it's got mm. that little section in that. And just what this album needs to breathe some extra life into it. Yeah. And there's a song, Call Me Mr. Madman. It's got a guest um, spoken word at the start from Biff Byford from yep. Saxon. Um, great voice to really mm. set the song. That was very cool. And that repetitive synth melody that they use, that's really haunting. Very well yeah. done. Uh, it's interesting how they can always continue to sound like Halloween and release a different type of album from start to finish, and they yeah. always incorporate something into their sounds. Because it's a really remarkable skill they've got with that. Yeah, a lot of bands try and sound contemporary or mm. whatever everyone else is doing, but they lose who they are. Yeah. The Halloween boys kept who they are. Um, I gave this eight sins out of ten. <laughs> so the, are you metal? Call me Mr. Madman. Long live the king. Raise the noise. Smile the sun. The sage, the fool, and the sinner. Wow. Okay, well, this time we didn't cross over on standouts, so this will be interesting. Uh, you did predict that I would like this, and you weren't wrong. Uh, this is cool right from the opening note. It's got that dark rage from the dark ride, but they've really built on that with great effect on this. They've gone for broke on that effect. The synth tones, like I was saying before, they're almost out of the Ramstein playbook for mine. The riffing is intense and aggressive. This is, the, like you were saying, it, it's probably the band's most mean album and I'm all for it. This works well for this band. Some really sharp tones with that digital kind of edge applied to them, but also some really good use of grit in this to not make it too clean or too dirty. Everything is really well balanced in that regard. So it does have that, you know, the European, when Ramstein were becoming a big thing and all that sort of stuff, the tones are around with that. Like Ramstein have all the digital stuff, but it's never too far gone that you lose the organic tones. And they've done the same thing here with this album. Uh, this would be uh, this could be the first time I've heard flute in any of their records, which I'm pretty sure it is there on Raise the Noise, I think it is. It's another mm-hmm. example of how this band always grows. And at the same time, the the melodic callback to Perfect Gentleman on Who is Mr. Madman, that the the line, the melody at the start of it, that's really cool. It, it shows they've they've kept the root of who they are and they just keep, you know, taking it through the the eras that they go through with this band. And it's another that, I found that to be a really cool trick and very well done. For how heavy and aggressive this is, there are some really well-placed moments of beauty on it. Uh, I've got to love how the track order, the whole thing flows really nicely. The slower tracks are really well done and really well positioned on the album. And the lyrics. The lyrics are fantastic on the release. Equal me- equal measure of sort of aggression and beauty in that regard too. So you've got some really good stuff in the, you know, the, the beautiful side. But the aggression they've gone through lyrically, like you were saying, probably the most brutal they've gone and it, like you said, they're out for blood. They they nailed that on this uh, on this record. And I like the kick this had in its overall sound. Like this one kicks out of the speakers at you or through the headphones, whatever you listen. This one, like it's smooth, but it's punchy. The vocal work is nicely presented in this too. Like the whole thing is a really interesting just listen, even you know, taking out the songs, but just the sonics of it was really cool. I like the harmonies and how the push and pull on all that sort of stuff was well done too. This could have been too dense or too much, and they didn't fall for that tra- that trick of trying to continue, you know, going down that rabbit hole. They, they knew when to pull up and, and do it the right way, which was cool. And there were some cool guitar moments on this. There was fantastic lead work, but I used I liked the use of sort of things like bends and pinch harmonics that we haven't really heard from this band too. And they also added some more sort of symphonic metal elements, which I was surprised by, uh, which is another refreshing twist on what they do. 
The bonus tracks fit nicely on this. Long story short, if you like the more aggressive and darker side of this band, then this is certainly one you have to check out. I really, really enjoyed this. And I'm sad I missed out on this record for as long as I have. Uh, this band have certainly surprised me and I'm looking forward to what we have coming up and whatever they do in the future as well. Nine out of 10 from me. Where the Sinners Go, Far in the Future, and You Stupid Mankind for my standouts on this record. That's why I said we didn't cross over on. Ooh, yeah. So we pretty much covered the entire album there. So you know, you'll, you'll find a song to like <laughs> if you like it was... <laughs> If you like what we're saying, you'll find a song to like. Only a couple to go. Uh, so next up is Straight Out of Hell, uh, 16 tracks for 74 minutes for the bonus edition or 13 tracks for 60 minutes for the original. There we go. Uh, the 14th album from the band released January 2013 via The End Records. They've got about a half dozen different record levels through the years. <laughs> um, produced by Charlie Bowfinder again at Miss Wynn, a studio in Spain. Uh, this album was intended to be a happier release after the darker work of the last few years as well as the band had a desire to release a positive album after all the 2012 doomsday, you know, predictions that were going on at the time then. Over to you. Um, switching gears again. They've mm. done a couple of heavy albums in a row. They usually go heavier than soft, but it's been a while since we've had the more fun side of Halloween. So yeah. lighten things up a lot with this one. Um, there's a lot, it's still got heavy moments like the previous record, Seven Sinners, but there's a song called Asshole. Mm-hmm. So back. Unfortunately, it's not the greatest song. I like that one. Yeah, it's yeah. fun, but it's not going to get too many repeat listens. Okay. All right. Um, the album starts with a seven-minute epic, uh, Nabatia. Mm. I can't pronounce it. but Nabatia. Yeah, mm. That's the one, yeah. Mm. Um, interesting, really haunting vibe for a bit of a Middle Eastern flavor to it. Very cool. Well, if you, do you know what that's all about or not? It's about Aztecs, the ancient Aztecs. No, it's actually about a Middle Eastern kingdom. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'll have to do some research, but yeah. Yeah, research it. There's, there's a bit of reading to do there. Okay. Yeah, I'll check it out. Um, some of the parts remind me of Keeper of the Seven Keys, the song. Um, yeah. They have been playing that song recently. Well, when they recorded this, they've been playing that. So probably the new guys were interested in writing something along that. Yeah. But yeah, there's some stuff that's very, very familiar. Um, doesn't have a theme or a concept throughout the album. It's, it's just like they set out to write as many cool songs as they could. And, yeah get back to writing a fun album just for them. Uh, it ranges from the metal songs like Waiting for the Thunder to the ballads like Hold Me in Your Arms. Mm. Um, the Most of the songwriting is handled by Andy and the new guitarist, Krishna. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a grow and a bit disjointed because yeah, it doesn't flow as well as some of the other albums. It's a good listen, but not one of the ones I chuck on straight okay. away. I gave it seven hells out of ten. <laughs> um, the first song, the Bratia, like yep. Live Now, Waiting for the Sun and um, Hold Me in Your Arms. They were the okay. standard. Nabatia is a really cool song. And yeah, it's about a, a, a basically, I think it's an empire that rose to prominence via trade. So the okay. whole thing about not being a conflicting, not a, not being a warlike nation is where that all sort of comes from. And that's why you listen to the lyrics of it. And like that one to me, the opening track actually made me want to go and research what it was all about. So, you know, I got a bit of a history lesson while listening to Halloween, which is something I didn't think would happen, but it did in this context. So there you go. Um, and also while I'm talking about it, to my surprise, I, I mentioned before that I've reviewed my God Given Right and the Keeper albums before, but it turns out I have reviewed this one before. I didn't realize until I put it back on again. So it was a pleasant surprise. Go, okay, I know this one. And I put it back on and, and away you go. And it's good to know that the songs can stay with you because uh, I would have done this probably in 2013 now that I think about it because we would have done it as a part of the show back then. So, yeah, having done that, it has held on. And I just remember what I was listening to sort of seven years on because I wouldn't have picked it up since then. So there we go. This one has that, it does have the fun Halloween, but it's also got a bit of the darker side of the Halloween as well. Like when you, you mentioned that Nabatia had the, the sort of the, the keeper elements going on with it, then it does work. And that has that just sort of that haunting sort of touch, not a dark and aggressive thing, but it's just that haunting edge to things. Uh, that is worked really nicely with the balance with the beautiful moments. There's some good hooks in this as well. Like some of the hooks in this are really well done. There are some really catchy songs on this record. I thought the composition was good. I liked how it was pretty, it switched from being heavy and frantic, but then they slow things down in just the right ways, just the right times. Uh, so it's not a punishing listen. It's just a really well-rounded album overall. Sonically, it is a touch deadened off, which wasn't um, to my preference but it does work for the style of what they're going for with this one i would like a little more top end to brighten it up a little bit 
But that said, the use of the synth and the folly work on this was really nicely laid into it overall and did give enough in the top end, but it just could have been a bit brighter. It's got a big meaty tone, which is the focus of it overall, uh, and allow, but it allows the vocals to cut through nicely, which is a good trick. Uh, and the whole thing, again, has that nice kick sort of going on with it. It's pretty well balanced, pretty well big, mixed overall. Like I said, just could have done with a touch more top end, but that's a preference thing, not a, not a serious critique because the actual technical aspect of it is really well done. I really like the lyrics on this one. They they seem to get better with lyrics as they go along, uh, which is cool. Uh, the the storytelling here was great, and it worked hand in glove with the composition, which is really nicely. It gave each song its own little epic feel. Not that all the songs were long, but they all felt like they were conveying a complete story. And there was some great groove on this. Not It's not all frantic riff work. There was some nice swing use on this. And again, they have this remarkable, rem- remarkable ability to filter the world around them and put it into the melting pot that is Halloween and come out with something that still sounds like the band while still expand, expanding and growing their horizons kind of thing. I thought with that, but they also never mimic things. Like we've referenced things like in the last album, like things like Ramstein, but nothing they do when they're doing all this filtration of what's going on becomes a mimic thing. They're not ripping anyone off. It's just always going and becoming another part of what Halloween are. Some of the lead work on this is fantastic. I don't know about you, but I liked how they've got the the dual lead work really works really nicely. But on this one, they use a bit of the blues, which also gave a bit of a thin Lizzy vibe to some of the guitar work going on on this. Did you pick up on any of that? Like, that's really cool. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Uh, And, as as always, though, there are all, there are new tricks with this with this album. Um, there are some really stripped back mixes with dry vocals on this, which you haven't really had a lot of up until this point, if at all. And then there are also some really big rhythmic shifts, more upfront lyrics like "asshole" and that. That you know, that this isn't just another album. They do some different stuff on this one. Like you may not be a big fan of the song "asshole," but for me, it was cool because it was so different to what they've done, generally yeah. speaking, around it. Uh, that and wanna be god as well like wanna be god is you know the tribute to freddie mercury and all that sort of stuff and they did some different stuff in that and you can tell they're paying homage a bit but it's not ripping anything off and it's not but it's also i don't think it is enough to alienate the fan base either these different things they they do it they stick it in there but it's not going to really piss anyone off if that makes sense you might skip them but it won't be it's shit that's what i that's what i think you know I think the shifts between the the heavier and softer stuff the, was really well done. The warmer tones on this were really nice too. The album flowed nicely. The tempo changes were good there. It's worth noting that this is the first time since Pink Bubbles go um, a, that we get explicit lyrics. They did mm. it on they did it on uh, Gorga from Walls of Jericho. Then they did it on Shit and Lobster from Pink Bubbles Go Ape. It's not an important thing, but you get three songs in a row on this record that have explicit explicit lyrics and that ties into what i'm talking about with arsehole being a different vibe on things yeah. so you know they've gone all these years without it and then they just dump three songs in a row on a record <laughs> where it's there so they've yeah it, it's it's interesting how they've done all that uh, all in all i thought this was a pretty cool album uh there's little to no signs of t- deterioration from the band for me i thought the bonus tracks been into it really nicely as well this whole thing is just the right amount of drama in it it's a really cool listen uh not not the height heights of what they've done but a very solid record eight and a half out of ten from me uh, waiting for the thunder asshole and make fire catch the fly i love the hook and make fire catch the fly it's great as well but now we go on to our final review of this process. I think what we'll do, Dave, is when the new Halloween drops, I think mid-2021, what you and I should do, and we'll see if the others want to jump in as well. But we'll, we'll review that album then and then go back and do things like the 25th anniversary album and the live okay. albums we haven't done for this process, do like a, a mini catch-up kind of a yep, that'd special be cool. on the band when, when, you know, cover the things we haven't done here and also the new one. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. No. What do you think of that idea? Sounds good to no. you? Excellent. Yep. We'll do it. We'll lock it in when we know what's going on with it. <laughs> no one knows the release date yet. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later because I'm very keen to hear it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Anyway, we do have one more to go. So this is Halloween with My God Given Right. Uh, 16 tracks for 72 minutes for the expanded edition or 13 tracks for 61 for the original. The 15th album from this uh, German band released May 2015 via Nuclear Blast. They're back on that label again. Uh, produced by Charlie Bauerfeind at Miss Winner Studio yet again in Spain. I think that's Andy Derris' studio, actually, which is why they keep doing it there all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is the band's first release with Nuclear Blast since 2003's Rabbit Don't Come Easy. And for this album, the band composed over 30 songs, which they then turned over to producer Charlie Bauerfeind and let him and his team choose which songs made the album at the end of the day. Over to you. 
Uh, there are some good songs in this album. Uh, it's a fun listen, but for me, I think it suffers from the weight of everything that came before. Mm. I mean, album number 15 is going to have all types of expectations. Yeah. Um, there's other albums I put on before this, but when I do put it on, I really enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with it. The songs are good. Composition and performances are great. It's just they have got better albums in general. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I think this album is fitting of their years. There is, there's no cartoonish humour or the menace on here. They just focus on writing songs. Mm. Um, and it's one of those albums where I think everyone will have different favourite songs. It depends on your own personal taste. Yeah. And it is oh, I guess quite, we'll find out. <laughs> Between yeah, and I will find out. It is quite a long listen too, but if mm. you just pick a song at random and just take that, it that yeah. can be a bit disjointed because of that. I think because they had so many songs to choose from, yeah. there's no real cohesive piece. Mm. Um, it probably comes to the other point. There's a few different versions that were released and Spotify seems to have as much as the complete songs from this era altogether. Mm. And one of the bonus tracks, Free World, I actually thought was one of the better songs of the whole package. That was, I think okay. was the last track. I, I liked yeah. Wicked Game. Okay. Out of the bonus yeah. tracks. Yeah, yeah, so there you go. Actually beautiful. Overall, I think this was an album for them, but it might have suffered from too much songs to choose from. I gave it mm. seven right out of ten. Um, standards were Heroes, My God-Given Right, Russian Roulette, uh, Stay Crazy and Free World. Okay. Cool. It's it's a quaint little thing for me, but it's it's nice to have sort of opened and closed this process with albums that I'm familiar with and have enjoyed in the past because this is one of the ones I had reviewed and I did remember reviewing this one uh, before doing this process. And, you know, we started off with, you know, we did the album beforehand, but you got the two Keeper albums, which I've done before with you in the past as well. This one to me is a little bit more of the the happy Halloween kind of thing, picking up picking up on it. It's got the brighter, more airy mix going on to it. It's a lighter feeling listen than the previous album was. Uh, it does tie in nicely and flow on from that release, however, which is cool. Like I said, brighter tones, a bit more sparkle about it. it. It hasn't lost the punch though, which is very well done. This is really nicely balanced in the overall mix and, and the energy on this is really cool as well. While the dog's doing something behind me, I don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> This one overall is a little bit less intense, especially compared to the previous listen. It still has solid melodies, the riffs, the hooks, all sorts of stuff, but it's a bit less attacking and a little more focus on leaving room for things like string sections and, and touches like that. Uh, some of the more heartfelt stuff on this too. Uh, this one overall, which is you know more of the happy Halloween style, there's, a, a, I guess, almost a nod to mortality in this one in some of the songs I've written. You can feel like the years are sort of creeping up on a bit and that's add a bit mm. of a a change to the depth and the tone to some of these songs. It's not a, not a morbid thing or a depressing thing. I just feel like it's the passage of time and this band has really felt the passage of time, especially the members that have been there for as long as I have by this point in time as well. It's less flashy than the past. You still get some of that, but overall it's a little more down the line in terms of overall, overall composition. It's not as complicated or as engaging in that regard as, as previous records have been. And while everything is okay and done well, it's a solid performance of production, all that sort of stuff, this one never really kicks into gear for me. It just sort of, it goes along, it's a good listen, but it's a little bit, it sounds like it's a harsh word, but pedestrian kind of thing. It doesn't feel like they're really gunning for things. They're like, okay, we're just sort of, eh, we're going. Yeah. It, that sounds meaner than I wanted to. It's, it's not meant to be like that, but there's, there's nothing inherently bad about this album. It's just not to the heights of the previous work. And they've set a bar so high for themselves that, trying to match up to it every single album is next to impossible. And, and when you break it down on balance, the fact they've done so well for so long kind of is more of a credit to them than anything else to have this album be the sort of, Oh, okay. Not quite nailing it. It's still a good album on its own merit. A lot of other bands would be happy to have an album this good, but by their own standards, this just doesn't keep up to it. You know, this is the first time I found uh, the bonus track or a bonus track more interesting than a lot of the actual album was, which, you know, I haven't had that until this album now, which is, I think where they chose the the songs for this or they had, you know, the producer choose the songs. I think the band probably should have had a bit more input at that point in time because it would have probably added more to overall album dynamics. The thing sort of goes through at a pace. It's good. It's all well done, but there's just not enough shifts in gear to sort of make, okay, you've got a definite high, definite low, and you're taking on a journey. It's sort of like, okay, we're just going through a long highway drive kind of a thing of a record. Still a good album. There's plenty of this band uh, or plenty of 
this to enjoy like if you like the band you're going to be happy with this release overall but there just is but there's nothing on this record that makes me go okay i'm going to jump out i'm going to pull this one off the shelf before i pull any of the other albums out to listen to except chameleon. but even chameleon like and this is better than chameleon but at least chameleon had a purpose in that it was just so diverse and different that you would you know what i mean there was something they were doing something artistic with that, if that makes sense. Whereas this one is just, yeah. they're just doing a bunch of songs. If that. Yeah, I get that. It's it like, it all sounds really mean. It's still a good album. It's just not, you know, I think they just finally fell foul of dropping an album that is good, but just not up to their established standards. They're honestly well past you for dropping, dropping an album. That's not as good as it could be. So I'm not going to hold it against them in any way, shape or form. I'm still keen on the new album next year for sure. I want to hear it. It's just, this one doesn't quite stack up. Um, and I don't think we're alone in feeling that way either. It's still a good record. I, I think that most bands would be happy to have a record this good, but just compared to their, their catalogue, it's just not as strong as it could be, which is a shame. But still, in the body of work, they've got a lot of good albums. This is still a good one. Go okay, 7 out of 10. Uh, the Swing of the Fallen World was my top choice on this one. Russian Relay, my God, given right with the other ones I picked alongside you. But yeah, if I was going to give an honorable mention, this one would be Wicked Game, the bonus track Wicked Game. I really did enjoy that one. That was a very good track but that's um that's our reviews done we we got there we we got through 16 albums in the end we did this one for so we, we did 16 albums and nearly 20 hours worth of music to get through this process you and i with the help of tim and nikki along the way so thank you both uh, to both of you for chopping in and helping us out with this one did you have any sort of we've got some lists and that to go through very soon but did you have any sort of final closing thoughts you wanted to go through with this band yeah yep um there are Kiski fans and there are Dur- Dursey fans and there are Kai Henson fans. Mm. And then there are the Halloween fans, the people who have been from start all the way up until now. And whatever era you love, you're guaranteed to get some good music. Yeah. And um, my, I've heard people say, like you were saying, your first introduction to Halloween was when you were in a record store with some friends. And they're like, nah, they're a shit band, don't bother. Yeah. That's not the first story I've heard about that. I've heard people say, okay. nah, Halloween, they're shit, they're pathetic, don't bother. Um, my dad uses them as coasters for his coffee. <laughs> you know, yeah. How can you yeah. say that about Halloween? Hey, I'm but, guilty uh, of overlooking them until now. So Yeah, I, I don't know what it is. Some people might think the album covers are too cartoonish, so they don't actually bother to listen to the music. Or some people just get stuck in their preferred era. But um, I would urge anyone that gave up after Kiski left to at least listen to some of the albums mm. because you are seriously yeah. missing out. Um, this band has gone through the wars, like many bands have gone through lineup changes, highs and lows, but the band always stuck to their beliefs and did it their way. Yeah. And they've really had a really impressive career. And if you love a particular member, you can always check out one of the many side projects or other <laughs> bands that they've gone on the family to. Family tree is huge, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And mm. I mean, it's not just one band, one member that formed another band. Sometimes there were two members that went on or whatever. So well, in the month some, leading up to this, we we did a know, couple yeah. albums. Yeah, yeah. We've still got a lot of albums to check out. I'm still discovering new bands. Yeah, um, I'm really excited to hear what this band comes up with as a seven piece because mm-hmm. I'm glad they did it the right way. They did a tour and then realized, hey, we can work together. Let's do an album. Yeah, rather than let's force an album. Yeah, yeah. They so spend they time it. together to get the the chemistry right. Yeah, and it's also been the longest gap in between albums, I think, ever with this band. Yes. Yep. So I think the fans' appetite is there, the nostalgia thing is there, the creativity of everyone involved is there. So it could be a fantastic album. And everyone's going to have their opinions of what it should be. Yeah. I'm just happy to hear what they've come up with because mm. I guarantee it's going to be great. Um, Halloween, for me, have always been the band, that, the metal band that you put on if you want to smile and have some fun. That's yeah. just that's happy, happy Halloween. That's what they've yeah. been about. <laughs> and with you and I being big fans of Halloween itself, this is kind of, it's, yeah, it, I'm, I'm not surprised you got into it, but I'm surprised at myself for taking so long to get into it. So I'm that's, yeah. that's it for me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Just making sure because we both sort of stop. Um, <laughs> look, like I was saying, for me, I'm pretty disappointed in myself for not getting onto this band sooner. Um, and you know, I, 
I enjoyed this process and I'm sad that there's that longer wait now for the new album. I was really hoping we get it this year, but um, obviously not because the world has gone to shit. Um, but this catalog of work has really impressed me. The stuff I heard before I enjoyed, but going through this just shows you how talented they are. And, and for a band that's gone through the wars as, as much as they have with member changes and all sort of stuff, they've really, the body of work is fucking impressive. And like you, if anyone has you know dismissed the band after Hanson or Kiski or whoever has left, I really recommend you don't do that because there's a lot here. You may not like every album. I know that some people won't like every album the way that we seem to have done for the most part, but there's going to be something in this catalog for pretty much anyone to enjoy, I would think. If you like rock and metal at all, this is a band you... Like I got put off when I was a kid by, you know, having mates like we talked about, just saying, you know, mm. don't worry about them. They're not, you know, everyone was a Metallica head, not Halloween. There's a, there's a difference in the feel, but this is beautifully composed stuff. If you get into, yeah, it's the more power metal or you know, a touch of the symphonic side. But if you like your things like, you know, you trans up your own orchestra as well. Like there's heaps of different styles and tones like the diversity across their career is impressive but for con the consistency of work within that diversity is good too i mean their worst album from me got a five out of ten that's their worst album from me and that's saying something there's a lot of other bands have rated a lot lower in my mind with a with even less of a body of work than these guys have had the consistency is the story for mine just how good they are and they're professional musicians always serving the songs which is what always comes through on these records too for me just yeah that consistency i've never had a band i don't think do this many albums like they did what have they done they've done 15 studio albums four live albums eight compilation albums six video albums they've had at least four gold records and have sold over eight million albums in their now 35 plus year career and for the level of consistency that displayed across all of that including on some albums not even a, having a permanent drummer <laughs> you know just they they've they've done it the hard way in a lot of respects and the how well they've done it across the duration is a credit to everyone involved in this project. I will definitely not be overlooking this band and I'll be going through, going back to this band probably a hell of a lot more at, the, at our top tens every year. We have a section where we, um, we choose a discovery of the year that we found in, in the year that wasn't from the year of release kind of thing. And so I reckon this is probably my, my discovery for, for this year is going through the Halloween discography. It's been a good ride. I've really enjoyed it. I'm now happy to say that I'm a fan of this band across its entire history. Not, not, you know, one era or another. I like the whole catalog, even the ones I didn't like that much. There are still songs on those records that I'm going to pull out and go, okay, they're really cool. So, you know, I am glad we did this. This was a lot of fun. So thank you for you to push in for this for as long as you push for it as well, because you've, you've wanted this one for a while. <laughs> So I'm glad we finally got there in the end. The only thing that I'm sort of sad about is we didn't get, not that it's a problem, but it would have been cool to get more opinions across yeah. the board to see if it had the same impact that it had on me anyway. Because I know that Brendan and Tim weren't huge, hugely knowledgeable about this band. So it would have been interesting to see if it had a similar impact on other people that weren't familiar with the band as it did with me. It would also be good to get someone like Nick's take on this stuff too, because Nick is a bit yeah, like you band. are. Yeah. So it'd be, it'd be cool to see where that would have landed on, you know, a bigger panel, but it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm glad that I got the time to, to do this one. So no, thank you for doing this all with me as well. Like you've put in the body of work, you've done every album. Hopefully it wasn't hard for you though. No, it wasn't hard at all. <laughs> all right. So now we're going to move on with at the end of these specials. Now we're, we're moving on to doing things like we're going to rank the albums in order. And we're also going to go through our essential listing uh, so individual tracks kind of thing. So a cap of 15 for this time around. Uh, but I'll go, Nick sent me through his ranking of albums. So I'll go to his ranking and then I'll throw to you and I'll come back to me. Okay. All right. So Nick ranked his albums from worst to best in this order. So Chameleon, which is not really a surprise, I don't think for anyone. Uh, so Chameleon, then My God Given Right, Keeper of the Seven Keys, The Legacy, Straight Out of Hell, Seven Sinners, Rabbit Don't Come Easy, Pink Bubbles Go Ape, The Dark Ride, Master of the Rings, The Time of the Oath, and getting into the top five now, you got Better Than Raw, Gambling with the Devil, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1, Walls of Jericho Number 2, and Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2 was his favourite album from the band. Over to you, Dave. What did you have? Okay, this is from... Okay, I'll go from worst to best. Yep. Um, Chameleon, obviously the worst. Mm -hmm. My God Given Right, Straight Out of Hell, 
Pink Bubbles Go Ape, Rabbit Don't Come Easy, The Keeper Legacy, Seven Sinners, Master of Rings, The Time of the Oath, Gambling with the Devil, Better Than Raw, Walls of Jericho, The Dark Ride, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2, and then Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1. Cool. Well, this was challenging because of the mm. consistency across their years. Yeah, it was yeah. actually really hard to put these into an order. So a lot of these I'm splitting hairs on. And, and if you ask me next week, would the list be the same order? Probably not. Oh, it's going to change. Yeah, yeah. guaranteed. Um, but for now, this is what I, what I settled on to do this process. And it's funny because my list is very different to yours and to Nick's as well, and also to the audience choice, which we've got coming up too. So, mm. which is... I guess for a band that's as consistent as this, it is, it is going to be so individual in taste, what determines what ranks where kind of thing. But anyway, going from worst to best for mine, I put Chameleon, which again is no surprise. Uh, then we did it. Like you didn't put in your list, so I didn't expect you to, but I put Metal Jukebox after that. That was followed by my God given right. Then the time of the oath, Pink Bubbles Go Ape, Rabbit Don't Come Easy, Master of the Rings, Better Than Raw, Straight Out of Hell, Gambling with the Devil Walls of Jericho, and then getting into the top five, Seven Sinners, Keeper of the Seven Seven Keys, A Legacy, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2, then The Dark Ride, my number two, and Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1 was my top two, and they were split by like that much. Yeah. It was so hard to decide between those two albums, which are two very different albums to each other, but both my favorite records. So there we go. Now, in addition to that, you and I sat down and decided to do our essential listening and we capped it at 15 songs from the band that we d- decided these are the ones that are either the best or the ones you have to hear or whatever criteria individually you put on it. But 15 songs, if you're going to make one album from this band, this is your album, go. Okay. Halloween has to be on there. Fantastic yes. song. If I Could Fly, Future World, I Want Out, Keep of the Seven Keys, Mr. Torture, a little time, victim of fate, murderer, I live for your pain, perfect gentleman, soul survivor, fallen to pieces, are you metal and light the universe? Wow. I think we've crossed over on two songs only. Wow. <laughs> so there we go. I think I'm right on that. So pay attention, but there's two songs we've crossed over on for this. So for mine, I when I do these ones, I try and, and do a cross section of their career and, and but this is still pretty merit based too. Like there's there's not me sitting there going, I have to have one from this album because I have nothing from my God given right on this list at all. So I wasn't afraid to drop my album if nothing if nothing stacked up. But I got Ride the Sky, Future World, March of Time, uh Someone's Crying, I believe, why? Mission Motherland, Midnight Sun, Mr. Torture. We crossed over on that one. Yep. Uh, Never Be a Star, Occasion Avenue, IME, Where the Sinners Go, Waiting for the Thunder, and then you have to have Halloween. Like that yeah. would be the perfect closer for mine. So, so I think, huh? Three songs we crossed over. Three, was it? Okay, yep. cool. So that's, that's it'd be cool. interesting. To, I haven't, pardon? That's a solid list as well. I'd go with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> both lists are pretty good, man. There's no wrong answer to this. It'd be, it'd be a nightmare to poll it, so I won't try and poll it. But mm. if, I, if anyone's watching, give us your top 15 and also rank your albums as well. Because on that note, we do have an audience voted uh, order of albums to go through, which will be, <laughs> let's see how this goes. This is It is interesting. It didn't go the way I thought it would go, actually. Uh, so here we go. Last to best. So least favorite was Rabbit Don't Come Easy. Really? Yeah. Whoa. I broke it down into I broke it down into pools. Like I did the initial polling, broke it down into pools based on what was most sort of, you know, what bracketed best together and then bra- voted those brackets. And if I needed a tiebreaker, I go back to the original voting kind of thing to add on to. And this is how it played out. Um, so Rabbit Don't Come Easy was the least favorite. Straight out of hell after that. Keeper of the Seven Keys, a legacy. That's not a surprise being down near the bottom, but you know, going popularity. Also, my God given right down there as well. Chameleon made it up to about the 10th spot, which I was surprised at, to be honest. I actually got a few more votes than I expected. Uh, Master of the Rings, then Better Than Raw, then Seven Sinners, uh, The Time of the Oath, Gambling with the Devil, and one getting into the top five-ish area now. So The Dark Ride, Pink Bubbles Go Ape, made it up there. Uh, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part One, 
then Walls of Jericho, and then Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2. Now, those three were always top three for this band as far as the audience polling was concerned. Although I wonder, because I did get a lot of comments, though, when doing this that people are saying, you know, they stopped after those albums. And it's like, yeah, go and go and explore the catalogue a bit further than that because you're yeah. missing out on some good, good stuff. be interesting to see, yeah, what people think if they go and do the deep dive like we've done. And, and yeah, like I said, if you're a big fan of this band, Go and give us your ranking of albums and give us your top 15 songs. There's a bit of homework for the people out there watching. If they can bother well, in the comments, you know what to do. Uh, give us your feedback on that. But that's, I think, the end. That concludes this special presentation for Halloween for 2020, all about the band Halloween. Uh, like I said, we'll, um, we'll go through some stuff when they drop the new album and just wrote down a note here before that we could go through the whole Halloween family tree as a different special at some point as well because that would be a huge amount of work to go through as well but we'll we've got never-ending ideas on that sort of stuff so we'll see what happens in that regard uh but yeah if you've enjoyed this one then please make sure you're following and hit the subscribe button wherever you, you're tuning into this be it audio or video or whatever else you're doing um follow us on all of our social media channels and all sort of stuff too and if you'd be so kind check out our patreon page any support you can give us on that platform would be greatly greatly appreciated uh, while we're speaking of that sort of stuff, a big thank you to our wonderful, amazing sponsors yet again in Squidding Screen Printing, Old Colton and Rockstar Finance. Find them, give them a follow. Their details are in the description, just like our details are. Follow us, follow them as well. Give them a bit of love for the support they give us here at the show. It would be greatly appreciated by us here. But that's it for Halloween for 2020. Um, you and I are the ones that are big Halloween buffs, so it's only fitting, I guess, that you and I were the ones that uh, stuck through it. So thank you to you for taking the time to do this one yet again. Uh, thank you to the other ones that contributed to this episode, and also thank you to you out there for paying attention to us for this long, for as long as you have. It's It's been an absolute pleasure to do this one, and we I can't wait to do I don't know what we're going to do for Halloween next year, but we'll find something, I'm sure. I will guarantee, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to go through. We'll work out something. But again, thank you for tuning in and thank you to you, Dave, for joining me with this one. But uh, we'll see you all again very, very soon. Uh, look forward to it. And But until then, I'm Andrew. I'm Dave. As always. Drink up. Rock on. Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs>